Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. And man, I'm so excited to uh, speak with my my guest today, Joe Barisi. Um, this guy is one of the most creative human beings that I've had on the show. Um, and his work ethic is awesome. And let me just get in and, and tell you about him. Uh, quick announcement, I want to thank our mutual friend, Doug Bossy. Doug, who's got a wing named uh, a, a wing named after him here at Everyone Loves Guitar for all the so people he's turned on to the show. So thank you for connecting Joe and I. Also, make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to the show. If you're watching us on YouTube, hit the subscribe button and the little icon emoji that looks like a bell that helps us out in the Google algorithm. Anyway, let me tell you about Joe. This guy is awesome. He's produced, engineered, and mixed some of the most important hard rock, metal, and punk bands of the last 15 years, including Tool, Soundgarden, Monster Magnet, Fu Manchu, Queens of the Stone Age, Bad Religion, The Melvins, Clutch, Alice in Chains, Chevelle, Caius, Anthrax, Limp Biscuit, Catherine Wheel, Slipknot, Nine Inch Nails, Wolf Mother, Weezer, and hundreds of others. Man, I can just, I'm done now, man. This guy's... What a wait. Although widely respected for his abilities as an engineer, he's first and foremost a musician. Started playing guitar when he was seven. Also, one of my homies from New York City played in local bands in New York and Florida. Studied classical guitar, piano, and music theory at USF here in Tampa and the University of Miami. He also studied engineering and spent hundreds of hours recording local bands, developing a patience and understanding for what goes on in the studio. You did your 10,000 hours, man, I'm sure, and then some. Yeah. A few more. I did a few <laughs> thousand hours. <laughs> Over the years, Joe's made some seminal records, including one of my all time favorite, one of the most well engineered records ever come out, which is Tools 10,000 Days. I don't even know how you did that. So it is literally perfect. Every sound in there, the stereo. I mean, I've spent hours listening to that. Um, Weezer's Vicarious yesterday, actually, and I got all excited again, too. What's that? I heard Vicarious again yesterday, and I was like, man, this kicks ass. It's great, man. The whole record, like, it's just a sonic, you know, perfection. Yeah, I think it's heavy. Oh, it's awesome. Weezer's Pinkerton, the Melvin Stoner Witch, and Queens of the Stone Age debut record, which got them signed in addition to many others. I will tell you that... Uh, there's tons of videos on YouTube with great stuff from Joe. If you're at all interested in sounds or just learning about engineering and mixing, go there and check them out. Joe also runs audio workshops that teach you exactly this for a very reasonable price at prosoundworkshop.com. Again, if you're, we'll talk about that later too, but um, there's great information online about Joe. Dude, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. I appreciate your thank time. You for having me. That's my pleasure. Nice to be uh, here. Likewise, man. Keith Partridge. Yes, the start tell, of it all. Tell me how Keith Partridge changed your life. And for everybody saying, Keith Partridge, I know that name. That was uh, from the, uh, what's his Part name? David, yeah, David Cassidy played Cassidy. Keith Partridge. Have at it, man. How did he well, change you know, your life? You're, you're, I started early, you know, being, living in New York. Uh, you know, my, my parents had a grocery store when my dad and his brother and my grandmother and her, her house was really close by. And there was a lot of AM radio and music always blasting. My, my first recollection of music is sitting on her porch and listening to AM radio. And, um, it's W A B C. I, I don't even remember. I was like six or seven, <laughs> you know, it's so long ago, but I, I still hear those hits like windy by the association and stuff like that. I just go, man, it brings me back to that porch and that crazy chair that fell on the porch that was way too big for me. I could get out of it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so, you know, Partridge family, you just keep Partridge, good looking guy. He's got all these girls swimming after him. And, and I was like, wow, this is, this is what's going on here. So uh, that's really the, those Partridge family records were so well done and so well crafted. And that's what, got me excited about learning how to play guitar. It's always, it's always the same story. Every, every guy wants to pick up a check, you know? So, um, and, and that, that's where it came up. Yeah. That's so funny. He's, he's the reason. So how did you first get in the music business? Well, you know, man, I, so weird, but uh, just playing in bands and, and studying guitar. I was always, I was really into education as far as I always, uh, believed in the, the 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 theory of knowing as much as you possibly can, and then forgetting it all. 
because that to me was better to to learn as much as you could and to know like to know every mode and every scale and every chord or whatever as many as you possibly could to know everything about anything connected to music and then just breaking all the rules or just you know as, as opposed to the other way around not knowing anything so so for me i uh, i studied i went to university of south florida i studied music theory instead of going uh working for a little while being in bands um you know and i went to university of miami you know with a recommendation from my guitar teacher at the time and and i didn't really know what i was going to do i was playing classical guitar in a monkey suit in a in a corridor in a outdoor mall you know and and playing like classical pieces that i have to learn from my music lesson that week and also playing metal pieces done classical style I, my audition tape for university of miami was d by randy rhodes you know i'm just I remember that song. Yeah. Right, so it's that deck and you know you sit there and, and so that's what i was kind of doing and i thought there's got to be something better than this and and uh, i came out to an aes show being in a music engineering program they they offered some kind of trip to california I honestly don't remember all of it other than when I got here and they were playing Iron Maiden on the radio. And I was like, <laughs> I'm out, I'm moving to California. So I basically <laughs> went back to Miami, packed up my junk, went to my parents for Christmas. The day after Christmas, got in the car and drove out here with my brother. Wow. That was it. Three days later, I was pumping down the street with a Thomas guy dropping resumes off and 30 or 40 resumes trying to get a job somewhere. And then that's, that's where it all started, man. It was a hustle from, from the time I, I left Florida. So two questions. You said you've always believed, which I wrote this down. This is great. Knowing as much as you can and then forgetting it all. What a great, um, a really good mantra. What, where did that come from? How did you get that in your head? I think, you know, like being playing with people and bands and just going, well, um, you know, I mean, a lot of times when you have technique, you're frowned upon because you can play and some, some, and, and I get both ends of it. Like even actually being an engineer and knowing about music and some of the records, some of the, like Mike Stone to me was the greatest producer engineer of all time. And his, his discography is the who's who of every, every record that came on the radio that sounded killer, he recorded what and what genre? Like, well, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar. He worked on the first six Queen records. He produced News of the World. Okay. That was one of his first productions. He did Journey in Asia. He did uh, The Romantics. He did White Snake, 1987. I mean, April Wine. All these April Wine. rock records. But then, if you look at his discography, you're like, these are all unique sounding records. And and I worked with him on a Blue Murder record that we both walked out on, honestly, and. Um, it was it was a lesson in engineering for me. But he, I also worked on a Y and T record with him, and he sat between his speakers and and you know I, and honestly I don't think he could tell you what a G chord is or a C chord was, but he could tell you what felt good and what sounded good. And that, so part of that craziness in your brain is how much you really need to know. Is it is it more feeling? Is it more energy? Is it more vibe? But in for me in general, I was always driven towards technique, but but I loved all the guitar players that were on the sloppier side, like Jimmy Page. You know, the Jeff Beck had technique. Jimmy Page was just as fiery and, and ripping, but not as technical. And Van Halen was off the hook. He had technique and feel. And then, so I, I knew there was a balance. So that, that's sort of where it came from. The long answer is, it was, it's easier to know as much as possible and then forget it than it is not to know. Because then you, you never know how far you can go. Which leads me to two different things, two stories. One of them was a very big turning point to me. It was you know you're a kid, you read Guitar Player magazine, and you'd worship that magazine. Every month would come along, I'd read it top to bottom, and I'd learn so many things. And I'd want to know, well, you know, that's the thing today. There's so many cameras on the whole time, but back then it was a mystery. And I remember reading an article with Steve Vai, talking about how he sat around and listened to his guitar like each note, like how it would feed back and ring. And, and I thought, oh, that's kind of crazy. And then I sat in my bedroom and I played E on the, the high string open. And then I'd fret the fifth fret B string, which is the same note, only it's in a different place on a different string. And it sounds totally different than an open E string. Then the ninth fret on the G string, same note, 
totally different than a piano, which is always the same note exactly on the same key. And, and it all made sense to me. It was a clicking moment in my life where I was like, it really comes down to listening in the end, it really is listening, which makes me a terrible listener to human beings, but a great <laughs> yeah. listener to how you play. Like, you know, I walk my dog in the neighborhood and I see dogs and I just go, wow, oh, that's Fifi or whoever, but I don't remember who Fifi's mom or dad are, you know? <laughs> but when it comes to listening, it, it really is, is like what is actually going on. And, and it led to, to a, something that we teach in my classes. It's, it really comes down to the part. The part tells you what the sound should be. Like people always get the greatest sound they possibly can. But I'm like, that sound is awesome, but it doesn't really work with how you're playing it. And that came down to this whole Steve Vai envisioned thing of listening to, this is listening to feedback and how the note changes and the, and the pitch of the note, the timbre of the note. And um, I thought that was a mind blowing uh, very simple, almost went right by me, but it was really a, a changing point. Like in my early teens, sitting in my bedroom listening to, trying to pick off Gary Moore solos, going, what, you know, where's that note? Is it on the E string or the G string? You know, and, and, and listening to tone that way, and that was huge. Um, what a guy for tone. Speaking of, yeah, oh yeah, it was just <laughs> incredible. Just the it was just you know the vibrato and things that. That people like the thing the, the guys that have a lot of technique sometimes miss the fire of the one note solo too and that was the the yin and the yang of it all i could appreciate the one robin trower note bent just right as opposed to the ingve malmstein solo but sure. then ingve malmstein solos that just make me go what the hell's going on i gotta rewind that a hundred times and play that <laughs> it's, it's incredible so um so there I am. I, I forgot even what the second one was. What was the second one? Yeah, man. I want to, this is good. This is like, um, that was the turning point. Um, God, I don't know. The second one was, uh, it had something to do with engineering. Uh, but basically in, in engineering to me, it's, I think, you know, people focus, I touched upon it a second ago a little bit, but you focus on the sound being perfect, but in the, in the end, it really is the sound of the band is the sum of the parts. And I, I learned that early on doing an L7 record, you know, I just thought, you know, these, these girls, one of the girls was having some issues and they brought in a session person and, and it just didn't sound like the band anymore. You know, it was just a little too good or too nice or less fire. And, and, you know, and that, you know, honed in on my tape editing skills. I'm like, well, you just need to put that person in there who might not technically be as perfect as a session person, but has a tone when they play and has a feel when they play that's imperative to the sound of this overall picture. So I, I always say it's like this big puzzle that's kind of elastic. You know, it always gonna fit and make this beautiful picture or maybe an ugly picture, who knows, but it, it kind of, it has to stretch and move. There's no perfection in it whatsoever. And I, it's kind of how I approach the records I work on is, I mean, 10,000 Days to me wasn't a perfect record, but it was a, a mind fuck compared to Lateralis before it. You know, Lateralis is an amazing, David Balch will produced, beautiful sounding record. But when I hear, like when I heard Stink Fist for the first time off of Anima, I was like, yeah. Man, if you had a record of that, it would be incredible. So that was my, like the dirt of Undertow and the, the amazing beauty of stink fist if that makes sense yeah up together and that was my my goal for you know the sound of Ten Thousand days and uh, it's it's a different record different than fear inoculum way different than fear inoculum which is a whole different era of tool which is cool because every record i think band should change and sound different one thing you said which i thought was really important is uh about context like you said you can have a great tone but you got to look at the context that's in, and I had never really, I, I, this is really interesting because that's very important, but it's one of those things you said, simple, but. I can tell you the day it occurred to me, I was mixing a record. I don't remember the record. I was in Sound City Studio B and I remember just working on this track and soloing the kick drum up and working on that kick drum till it was the most phenomenal kick drum sound in the world. And when I had it soloed, I was like, wow, this is the greatest kick drum I've ever heard in my life. 
and then I unsoloed it, and it was the worst kick drum sound I've ever heard in my life. Because in the track, it didn't matter. It just didn't sound like anything. It didn't work in the track. So that the beauty of you know individual sounds that are all perfected. I mean, like you can bolt on an arm and Frankenstein a leg and do whatever you want, but that right. doesn't make the human being a better human. It's yeah. just physically perfect or whatever. So that's that's a mix to me. That's a song to me. It's just it's not physically perfect. I remember all the weird stuff in records, you know. And when I'm teaching my classes, I'm always talking a monotone voice like this, and I say, if I was to do this all the time, and you would never actually pay attention to anything I said. <laughs> but when I have that inflection that's the thing that you pick out in music and that's yeah. what makes you excited about music. So, you know, genericizing it is not good. It's, it's the imperfections that, that I think I really love about stuff. And sometimes I hear people's mixes and I go, fuck, I wish I could mix like that, man. It just sounds perfect. And I hear my stuff and then I actually drive faster. I just go, it's a little dirty and sloppy, but, and it's maybe not the greatest sound here or the greatest sound there, but in the end, it gives a shit it sounds like I want it to sound like. Man, so it sounds like one of the most important things you're bringing to the table is first and foremost, you just love good music. And that more than how does a note sound, it seems to be much more important. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's, it's I mean, if you, you know, this is a, this is a very, it's not always a thankful job. So very thankless sometimes. Oh, and, oh, you're dealing in minutia. Are you yeah, kidding? Yeah. And, and having the the be able to exercise your demon off the side here and look at you know complicated things and then bring it back in and go, is this exciting or good or musical? It's, so to to have to work on something for that long, you really have to love it. And, yeah. And, you know, I, I can actually cite the two or three times I've done stuff for money. Where I was like, wow, like the cash is great. I'll do it. I've, you know, that's the day you get on the on ramp at the the studio and you get in a car accident. You know, <laughs> some kind of karma is hitting me up right now for taking that cash. So that those are the life lessons you learn. You know, you never mm -hmm. never do it for the money. I mean, obviously, you know, you, you have to survive, but to do it for that reason is not yeah, fun to do. not not fun and it's karmically weird. Yeah. When you moved to LA, you said you were handing out 30, 40 resumes your first day. What was your intentions when you moved there? What were you looking to do? Were you looking to get into engineering? Were you looking to play? I, I had put in playing out of my picture at that point in life. Um, I was looking to be an assistant engineer in a studio to learn all these things that I thought I should have learned in school. And that you know you let you learn a lot of book stuff in school and you learn where to find information and sometimes that's just as important as learning the information because there's no way somebody in a college can prepare you for work in a certain genre of music or a certain studio so so the the part of school that the beauty of our workshops is this is like this is how it's done and this will save you a lot of time that kind of thing but there really wasn't that kind of stuff when i was coming up so I wanted to be an assistant engineer and I applied to probably 50 places in two days. And the only person that would hire me was a place called Cherokee, which is a famous studio at that point too, but they wouldn't hire me as an assistant. They hired me to do some tech work because I could solder. So they, uh, okay. they, they had these consoles, these Trident consoles, and they were making their own version of the Trident console. Very first time that somebody was actually manufacturing a, outboard mic pre eq and i was back there you know soldering resistors to switches and stuff and probably not doing a very good job at it because i'd never done anything that intricate before right but uh that was my my first gig and i was repairing guitars at night in a, in a music store okay and that's uh, that's how i made money and the only reason i was repairing guitars is because i got so used to taking my own apart you know trying to figure out how things worked that was a, that was the other the other uh, part of my, my, my being was taking stuff apart, not being able to put it together very well, mind you. I'm, on, I'm always the guy that has the one spare part left over just going, Damn it. <laughs> I wish I would have taken a photo of that. <laughs> <laughs> and even like to be an assistant engineer, because I've had a lot of guys on the show start, that's not like a, that's like the gopher. And, you know, you're like, it's not like a super glamorous job. 
out here, I think the, the most common path was to be a runner. So okay. Was, so you basically work the desk, you answer the phone, you take the messages, you order the food, you go get the food. And right. Then, then you graduate to be the assistant where you're sort of the, but I, I never wanted to be the runner. I would be everything. So I would be the runner, the assistant, the maintenance guy, right. the trash guy, whatever. I was totally fine with that, but I, I just couldn't sit behind a desk and answer the phone and say, you know, whatever. Welcome. Aloha. Thank you for calling. Yeah, <laughs> Aloha, <laughs> Mr. Hand, or whatever, you know. I mean, oh, like, Mr. Hand. <laughs> so, oh my I, God. I, you know, it's, I oh, watched that. I just got it. This is weird that you said that. I have a guy coming on the show and he's a young kid and he looks like Spicoli. So last night I'm watching Aloha. I'm watching the, oh, I enter Spicoli and all these, and it's I have, Aloha, Mr. Hand. I cannot believe you said that. How weird is that, man? Well, I didn't want to be that guy to sit behind the, this desk and say, Aloha, Mr. Hand. <laughs> so, yeah. How, oh I, my God. I intentionally sought out smaller places where I could, you know, go in right as the assistant or be the only guy. So I, there was a place called Preferred Sound that was in a, in a house and I would be the, the guy who opened up, the guy who cleaned before the client got there, the guy who made the coffee, the guy who prepped the session, the guy who went and got a hamburger, came back, plugged the mic in. You know, I remember going out for, uh, you know, Michael Shanker, I worked with Shanker for a second and, and he was like, that was one of those holy shit moments, you know, where you're just like, Let's just erase everything and let this guy play guitar on everything. We don't need drums or vocals. Here. <laughs> like that moment, you know, but I'd go out and get like one day I'd go out and get baby Ruth's and the next day I'm going out and getting healthy food. And I'm like, it was my first insight into extreme craziness, you know, but I could see just, he couldn't, you know, I'm like that myself. I'm like, man, what am I going to eat today? I think I'm going to eat three pieces of cheesecake and skip dinner. And then the day, <laughs> Yeah. The next day I'm juicing, you know, I'm like, oh, what is wrong with me, man? But it's just, <laughs> it's just it's part of the crazy, I think. And uh, the creative, we just, you know, I don't know. But I can tell you, watching Michael Shanker play guitar, that was like. What was that like, man? Oh, ridiculous, dude. It was, it was, it was that flying V. Yeah. And he had his step stool and he had a four track cassette. That's how long ago this was. And he would play, he would listen back to a four bars on the, on the cassette deck and he would play the part and then he would double it. And then he'd listen to the next track of the four track and it would be a harmony. So he'd refresh his memory and he'd compose his symphony top to bottom a few bars at a time. And then when he was done with that orchestration, he'd say, okay, open up a few tracks, I'm just gonna solo. And then he would play top to bottom and just rip. And I was like, holy shit, man. Like, what do you do to that? That's the most greatest thing I've ever heard. And he's like, I could do better. Give me another one. And this is tape. There's not Pro Tools. So right. I'm on a 24-track tape. I've got like three tracks left. He blows through three tracks. And then I'm like, fuck it. We got another one. Let's erase the room sound. We don't need that shit. They can just reverb on that. <laughs> you know, screw it. Uh, we don't need the bass amp. We could got the bass DI. We could read it. <laughs> Let's get rid of that here. Let's blow out another few solos. Do we really need the lead vocal? <laughs> <laughs> wow. What, what, what year was that? God, it would, it would Ballpark. Been, uh, in the mid-90s, I guess. Uh, yeah, right now. That's yeah, amazing, man. Uh, so, okay, so what was your first break in L.A.? I can tell you a couple, a couple different experiences. One of them was this place called Preferred Sound and a band called Rhythm Tribe, and it was this uh almost um gypsy kings ish type yeah. band and i was the assistant and um the two guys two brothers and a dad who was involved and the dad was a super nice dude and they, they were all really nice but they they weren't getting along with the engineer for whatever reason and then i could tell they were asking me questions and i i mean i was green i'm like you know my job is to help the whole session run smoothly, but I was never the go-getter, like to inch the engineer out of the picture. I was always there to help the engineer. That was my job, assistant engineer. And But one day the engineer didn't show up and they were like, he's fired, you're in. And I'm like, so that was one of those things where, okay, I'm in the hot seat. Um, There's a, a couple different guys that were very instrumental in my, my being. One of them was Jason Cassaro who passed away a couple of years ago, but he, um, 
he was one of those guys who when you heard an album that he worked on it was unlike anything you've heard before it was like the power station drum sound you're like what is going on here this guy was so innovative he was detuning toms with harmonizers and using the ssl automation because this is pre pro tools you know he's running the tape machine at 15 instead of 30 so he can slow it down so he can do tighter cuts wow and things like that like well beyond the the norm of crazy like you're always taught purity of sound you know the beautiful vocal mic and the one mic pre and maybe a little compression and this guy would slap a mic pre into a mic pre into two or three compressors and four EQs. And you're just like, this can't be good. And then you'd hear it and you'd go, what the fuck? This is the greatest thing I've ever heard in my life. So he was, he was one of those guys that kind of took me under his wing. And, and um, he's, uh, he would hire me to come work on records with him. And uh, I would stay with him in New Jersey. And, and we'd work in New York or in, in Connecticut or in Jersey or wherever. And, Another guy was Garth Richardson, who produced the first Rage Against the Machine record. Who what a record! Pre Rage, uh, you know, but it was back common in the days that where you you work in a studio quite a bit, and you can call the studio manager and say, "Hey, I've got a demo. I would like to do. Try to develop this band." And they they would let you break in whoever you wanted, you know, and bring in the new kid, the runner, and he can be your assistant, and you can work out the room, and and you can have it for a discount. And, and so Garth was doing a thing at Sound City with a band called Little Gods. And his, his normal guy didn't want to work for free. And I was like, fuck it, I'll do it. So I, I was like three days in, I think we did three or three days total. And we hit it off and it was fun and I didn't get paid to do it. And I was like, fuck, this is what I want to do. And the next record comes along and he's like, you know, I can pay you a little extra to be, to be the engineer. And then that turns into a couple of years worth of work. So. It all came down to you know, a few crucial people like that. And then, you know. It's amazing, man. Willing to, willing to take a bet on you and also gambling yourself, man. You know, a lot of people take the easy way out. I was like, screw it. If I'm going to fail, I'm gonna, I know I failed. I'm not going to wonder ever, ever. You know what, man? I, uh, that is such a good th- I, When my kids were younger, both of them, they both got their first jobs. I, I wrote this letter, I, me being a copywriter, marketing guy, and it said, um, hey, listen, hire me, and if you don't think I'm the best um, grocery bagger, I will, don't pay me, I'll be, you know, don't pay me for two weeks, just test me out. And they both got their jobs right away. Like, there's zero risk to that, what you just did. Like, why, why? Why would you not? And look at your, look at the career you've had because well, you know, so there's luck. Wanted too. to learn. But to me, it's funny that you say bad groceries because I always say I'll bag groceries before I do that gig. <laughs> no problem bagging groceries at all. It's not yeah. the best bagger of groceries you've ever seen. Before I sit in on a session where everybody's an asshole or I don't like the music or whatever, I don't care yeah. what. You're I mean, you know what I mean? So it's always been driven to do the best job when I agree to do it. Yeah. But, or not do it at all. So. Where do you think that came from that? Like, um, I don't say the will to win. It's like the Raiders, but, uh, which I'm my in groceries at my dad's. When I was <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. You know what? We talked about this when we first, you know what? Uh, they've done studies and the best people to hire are people who work on a farm or people who work for their parents. Tell you, man, it's you know, it's unforgiving. It's, yeah, I wonder, well, I actually ended up quitting and working at the AMP just to prove a point. <laughs> <laughs> I was That's working with my brother at the time and he's very, you know, socialite and he's like, oh, good morning, Mrs. Whoever. And, and I'm like, shut up and put some soda in the fridge. <laughs> So that was the. So that was your work ethic training, working for your dad. Yeah, that'll do it, man. Uh, uh, man, I got to ask you this. Your nickname is Evil Joe Parisi. Where did that come about, man? Oh, so good. Um, it's actually such a twisted, tiny little world, too. But I worked on a Judas Priest record. Right. Which one? Uh, Angel of Retribution. Okay. The drummer. And Judas Priest is a guy named Scott Travis. 
And uh, Scott Travis is, I knew who he was because his former band was Racer X with Paul okay. Gilbert and sure. uh, uh, Juan Alderetti and uh, uh, Bruce Boulet. And, um, and I loved Racer X. And so, um, so they had this prank phone call called Evil Joe. And because my name is Joe, and we play that prank phone call all the time. They started calling me Evil Joe and that's sort of where it came from. Uh. So fast forward, I don't know how many years later I've been known as Evil Joe and I kind of knew why. And I, I obviously, I played it so many times, like when Tool, I played it when I was doing 10,000 Days so many times. Those guys played Coachella and that was the opening song. Like I'm literally in 60,000 people at Coachella and I hear a phone ring and I'm like, no way. And then they they play that whole prank phone call. The that phone call that you have on? Oh, my yeah, God. That was, and then they came that's on. Not you, that's not you? No, it's not me. So, but so, I thought he's, he's calling, but he's calling Joe. That's what I, oh, okay. He's calling some random dude oh, in the paper that's looking for a black metal band. Yeah. Black metal band. So I found out that the group <laughs> was running, like Scott always told me it was, it was some dude named Mike Martini. Yeah. So, but I'm like, how's the, what's the affiliation here? And his brother plays bass. Yeah. What a small world. So Craig, I'm, his brother, Paul Craig. Gilbert. Right. So I'm watching Paul Gilbert play at the, at the house of blues solo thing. And his band is on stage and they're ripping up. He's such a great guitar player. Yeah. I had him on the show. He's the band really and good. his bass player's name is Craig Martini, right? Or mm -hmm. Martini. I was like, holy shit, that's Mike Martini's brother. It totally makes sense now. He's friends with, then that's why Racer X did this song called Evil Joe with with samples of the phone call in it. Uh, and then Sepultura so did it. Sepultura played a backing track to that phone call. I was in Colchester, England doing a record with this band Raging Speedhorn, and they put it on as a hidden track on their album 666 uh, seconds after the album finished. I mean, there's so many Evil Joe references. It's so funny. That's hilarious, man. Did you get to uh, hang with Sepultura by any chance? Um, I, well, I worked on a, um, a band that uh, Andreas was in. Uh, yeah. Project. So, and he's been on your show. Yeah. Um, he's he, such really, he wasn't in town. He was in Brazil at the time. And um, the, guitar, the drummer was there, um, Alex from Mana. Like yeah. A group, and the singer, uh, Andres, from uh, another band called Animal. And then the bass player is back home too. So it was uh, Ross Robinson produces kind of this super group side project. And um, so that's what uh, I've talked to him on the phone. And then we met in person after that. But uh, I'm, I've never, I've been offered a few times to go down to Brazil and mix a simple tour record, but it's never worked out schedule wise. And uh, Oh, that's too bad. He, he He's like such a mega superstar and he's like so so mellow and humble man so normal yeah yeah and a great guitar player just, oh, just through the roof man wow i can't believe what a small world it is it all these things are it's like uh six to you know whatever that kevin bacon movie is you know well, so can... so i hook up uh, i become friends with mike martini on instagram <laughs> make those phone calls right and and justin from tool loves that skit obviously and so uh he uh, invites mike to the tools show when they're doing those. The when we started cutting the drums on the last record, they took a month off after and they did a five show tour and they did these uh, workshops, like these, whatever they were, seminars or something. And Mike shows up at one of them. And uh, <laughs> like some of the craziest fucking questions, but <laughs> Justin knew he was coming, but didn't tell anybody else. So, so be really thinking this guy's disrupting the show, but Justin's losing his shit because this guy's saying, I'm going to meet you down on 72nd in St. Clair. Or whatever. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> you know, he's just, just reciting shit from that, asking the craziest questions. And uh, it's, it's actually become quite fun. That is funny, man. So that's how you got your name. What a good, what a good nickname story, man. Evil Joe, you know. Famous he Evil used Joe. To be smiling Joe before that. But, uh, that's hilarious, man. Um, Joe's House of Compression, your studio. I love that it's located in a former lawnmower and garden. And I like that you kept the sign. That is such like, that's like one of those old uh, iconic signs, man. It was outside, but when I moved in there, it was inside and there was a lawnmower hanging on outside. <laughs> I started getting, you know, people knock on the door because it says the address and, and they were like trying to get me to repair their 
and they're a leaf blower. And I'm like, <laughs> Hey man, do you do sprinkler systems? <laughs> my head is to do how I do my own, you know, but I was like, I think you got the wrong place, man. And then, but it, it's actually quite an interesting building as well. Cause it belonged to, it belongs to the same family that that's had it forever. The guy's grandfather built it. But at one point, Kevin Gilbert was in there for yeah. point matinee. And, uh, his girlfriend was Cheryl Crow. Oh, interesting. Before Cheryl we- Crow was big, and he loved Hugh Padgham and all the records that Hugh produced. So he flies to London, evidently. There's a story I heard later on after he passed it. He flew to London and measured out the room in the townhouse because he loved that room, and that's all the stuff where Hugh, Hugh Padgham worked. And then came back and kind of built a long and narrow tracking room. And then fast forward... I've got the console from the townhouse. Wow. Which is crazy. So the drummer, um, Brian, came by and told me the story. And I was like, holy shit, dude, I got goosebumps right now. It wasn't yeah. from the same room. There's only two rooms at the townhouse. It was from the other room. But the fact that I was the second owner of the console from the townhouse, and Kevin Gilbert loved the townhouse to the point where he tried to make the room the same dimensions and stuff as but that's where Tuesday Night Music Club came from also. So Cheryl Crow did her first record with Hugh Patrick. Evidently, A&M didn't think it was right, the right fit or whatever. So she wrote some songs with Kevin Gilbert and his band. And every Tuesday night, they jammed down at uh, Bill Betrell's place. And every Thursday night, they jammed at my place. And she called her album the Tuesday Night Music Club. And didn't you work on one of her records? I worked on a song. Or a song, okay. A tribute record for Sun Records, I think. And George Draculius was the producer. And she was, it was, she was the artist. And um, it was all session guys. And she came in and sang. And uh, I think it, it might have just been a day. But yeah, it was, some singers sometimes are just like, and Kelly Clarkson was the other one. I'm just like, it doesn't matter. She doesn't warm up. It does not fucking matter. She goes behind a microphone, belts it out. And you're like, what do you do to that, man? That's it's a that's a real vocal, you know, now you expect I'm going to comp 18 tracks and I'm going to fix a few notes here and tune here. And then, you know, it's, it's weird to me sometimes when you get, when you sing the same song over and over and it's five times, it's five different ways. And you're just like, you know what I mean? Isn't there a way like, right. Right. But everybody changed their part the whole time. And there's, there's only a few singers that have been that Janie Lane from Warren, one of the best singers I've ever recorded in my life. He did really, tell- so he doubled himself so accurately that it would disappear like phase because he would sing he had such technique he could hit the note hit the pitch hit the vibrato it was incredible and i did all these demos for it was actually my first pot in the record was i did demos on cherry pie as a engineer dave eaton was a guy house engineer at sound city he was a big it. record if i remember Massive. I remember him coming in after the record was done and they needed one more song. He brought in a drum machine and we sat around in Studio A at Sound City and, and did this song, Cherry Pie. He's programmed it, thought. put the bass on it, put the guitar on it, sang it. It was like one afternoon. And then they went in and they did this, did the album with uh, Bo Hill. And I was like, I mean, I, I have demos from the Dog Eat Dog record that'll blow your mind. Wow. It's so heavy. And so How do you... Good. How, do you have like a catalog? I can't imagine uh, like how, how many thousands of gig, uh, you don't even go by gigs probably. What, yeah, what do you, it's like sets. How many thousands of cassettes did you have? Uh, or dats or, you know, CDs, all, all the Pinkerton era stuff. Yeah, I, was, I was the first guy on Pinkerton. There's a lot of engineers on that record in the end, but uh, I, I probably did 70% of the record. Dave Fridman did another, you know, 30 and then, or I'd, maybe I did 60, he did 30, and the other 10 guys did 10. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, um, there's so many rough mixes of that stuff and so many versions of things that are, you know, just even yeah, everything. There's, a, a, anytime you're making a record, you know, last Soundgarden record, Chris was singing a song, and I was like, man, this could be an acoustic song. Let's just turn off the, the bass and put the acoustics up and turn off the guitars. And, and he was like, yeah, it's kind of cool, man. Can you, can you work it up, you know? So there's always those kinds of things that are sitting around that, that one day, like you discover the Thin Lizzy catalog in somebody's garage in Ireland and you put out this 80 CD box set, you know, one day, <laughs> one day somebody be in my closet somewhere going, man, it's got a Caius demo. What's going on here? 
man, I got to tell you something weird's going on because guess who I've been, li- all, I never listened to them. I've been listening to Thin Lizzy for like the last oh, few days. So you awesome. mentioned that and then you mentioned uh, Aloha, Mr. Han. <laughs> we have like some, we need to like talk about betting lottery tickets or numbers yeah. or something, man. This is some weird stuff going on. Um, I want to talk to you about, you have a great, reputation for getting great sounds and and obviously anybody listening to this could appreciate the efforts and the creativity you go to to get through that i've watched um so many interviews of you online um and you mentioned a couple of things and i apologize because i hope this will be the only time i'm asking you something that you've been asked before or to to talk about something you've been asked before uh i'd love if you could share the story about um a B testing 40 pickups over the weekend and just other, you know, things. Well, I mean, it's funny, but it's, it's, it's funny as a story, but man, let me tell you, the guy that's doing that is the guy I want working with me. Well, you know, early on when you, the one thing I I hated about working with, like when you work with a band a lot of times and I always worked at cheaper studios because it afforded more time for experimentation. And then as budgets became less or, you know, you hire a bunch of session guys and they're all getting paid by the hour and they want to come in and there's a noon downbeat to show up at 1155 and they expect their drum kit to sound amazing at noon. And you're like, well, you know, I got the mic up, but no one's hit it. You know, I mean, it's, that's the drum sound comes from the, you know, the hands, you know, so, so the whole experimenting thing is one of those things that's been you know, part of my life forever from, from buying a guitar with a Floyd Rose and wondering how to restring it and taking it apart and then going down that rabbit hole. So, um, the, the AB testing came from, uh, having some guitars laying around a studio. And sometimes you pick up a guitar, you know, the, the one thing about working at sound city is that it felt comfortable. I always saw that people were comfortable. It was like a rehearsal room. You mean aesthetically comfortable, like sitting, yeah. like you'd want to, it, like the couch wasn't made out of like, you know, gold lame or whatever, you know, yeah, it, it yeah. was like, you'd sit on it and you're like, Oh man, I don't, I'm afraid to put my feet on the coffee table, that kind of thing. But mm. it always le- uh, made it easier to create music because no one felt like, Oh my God, I'm paying $2,000 a day here, or I'm afraid to put my Coke down on, you know what I mean? So the, the comfort factor. Yeah. So the, so having a guitar in a studio and somebody sees it and it's really nice and they're afraid to touch it. So I, I walked into this uh, store and I saw this distressed Les Paul and it was, uh, it was a Gibson Les Paul, but Bill Nash was a friend had just, you know, did his thing to it. And I picked it up and played it and I go, this is one of the, it felt like this guitar has been played since 1959. Wow. So I wanted to buy when that one was sold. So I'll, I got introduced to Bill and um, I bought one of the guitars and it's a, like a 2007 Les Paul. He basically finds his guitars and then he strips it down and he does his thing to it. I'm like, can you make a cherry sunburst? I really love Jimmy Page. I don't have a cherry sunburst Les Paul yet. So he did and he, he sent it to me and it turns out this particular guitar is uh, chambered. Right. Well, it's super light. So people love it because they're not picking up a 14 pound weight. So, but that being said, I wasn't used to hearing a chambered Les Paul. And he put a couple different pickups I'd never used before. And usually when I buy a guitar, it's, it, it's just you buy the guitar because it sounds good. I usually hardly ever change pickups out. And if I do, it's just experimenting. And then, you know, whatever. You know, I bought a Kramer. I put a couple different pickups in and got rid of the Kramer pickups, whatever. But this particular guitar just wasn't quite right yet to me and he did some really cool wiring stuff to it that got me thinking and then actually it was at doug's and doug had some 120th anniversary les paul and I <laughs> that been, sounds like doug <laughs> i've been mean, going down this like rabbit hole of jimmy page and with the little switches that he puts underneath the the uh pick guard and, and i've always been a fan of the series parallel and the phasing and and I, and on as a quick aside seymour duncan makes this thing called a it's like a, a pickup ring. It's like, a, it's called a triple something. I can't even think right now, but the most fascinating thing about this ring is you can just wire your pickup to the ring. And then you can just use these two little dip switches on the ring itself to give you a couple of different combinations. So you don't have to modify your guitar at all. You don't have to drill holes in it. Oh, wow. It's cool as hell. You buy a, a four conductor pickup and immediately 
with this pickup ring, you can do all these crazy wiring, which I've done on a couple guitars. I got a couple of those rings. So anyway, I met Doug's and he's got this guitar and it's got all these push pull switches on it and coil taps. And so I decide I'm going to go into this Jimmy Page mode on this Bill Nash, Les Paul. And I, I'm like, okay, I really want to do this coil tap, the humbucker and the bridge coil tap, the humbucker and the neck. So I put two push pulls in it and I noticed a lot of these guitar pickups sounded great as a humbucker or great split, but not great as both. And, and I had some time. So I literally had a stack of pickups and I got to the point where I could just pull it apart, solder in a pickup, record it, humbucker or split, put it down, pop another pickup in 30 minutes later. And then one afternoon in eight hours, I had done like 16 pickups. And then the next wow. day did another half dozen pickups. And then, so I went through about 40 different pickups, recorded them all, listened to them all. And I came up with this combination. And then I ended up putting a, a push pull pot on the tone control that I totally didn't know what I was doing. I was just randomly soldering things. I thought I was flipping the face somewhere. And it, in the end, what I did was I flipped the phase, and because I'm using this uh, blues bucker DiMarzio in the front, and it uses a, a dummy coil to cancel the hum, but one lug is a lot louder than the other, so I can use, when you coil tap, you can get the humbucker, you coil tap and you get the fat coil, and then if you pull this tone pot, you get the dummy coil, so your volume goes away, but when you blend that in with the bridge pickup, and because I flipped the phase on it, it can go full Telly or Brian May. So all these guitar sounds are coming out of this guitar. So I stopped at that point. I didn't go full Jimmy Page. And I had no idea what the hell I did. So I actually sent a diagram to Eric at DeMarzio. And I'm like, what did I do? And he's like, oh, you did this. You know, it's like, it's guys that do that for a living. And, and I'm like, why does it sound like this? And then he explained about the blues bucker and the dummy coil. But, but it's, it was because of Doug's guitar having so many possibilities. Like his had the pull the tone knob out of the bridge uh, bridge pickup and it would get rid of all the pots inside, all the wiring, and it'd go right to the output pot, wow. which I thought was awesome too. I never went that far because in the studio, I wanted all the freaky shit, mm. but I love the idea of it. Maybe I'll do that next. I got to buy another push-pull pot though. <laughs> which, what, which pickups got you closest, if you remember, to, the, to uh, Jimmy Page? Uh, so in... In well, what got me closest to what I wanted was uh, it's called um, uh, a dual sound, DiMarzio dual sound, which is basically it's a DiMarzio distortion from the 70s only with the four conductor, so you can coil tap it. They actually sold the pickup with the push pull pot, so you could not modify your guitar, and so that's in the bridge. And that to me is for a high gain pickup, high gain in the 70s was like 10. You know, now high gains in the 20s. Okay. Um, so wow, it's I didn't notice that a high. fat, rich sounding pickup. It's got some gain and it sounds great. Coil tap too, which was the whole thing about that pickup. And then in the neck position, I use this DiMarzio Blues Bucker, which is this, it's an incredible neck pickup. And if you coil tap it, it still has this nice thickness to it. But because I put the push pull tone, I can get the dummy coil as well so I can lower the volume. And then when I flip the phase, it goes, when I put the pickups in the middle, you can cancel between the bridge. So just dialing back a little volume between the bridge and the neck, you can, it goes anywhere in between Telly and Brian May at that point. It's incredible. Wow. That's that, my favorite combo. The blue, the, uh, the blues bucker, is that low output? It's, uh, it's, I actually don't know, honestly. It's just like, because the dummy coil is low output, I can lose volume that way, but it's okay. pretty well matched. And in the Les Paul, it's a super fat yeah. position. It sounds almost like you, when you go to the neck position and you roll your volume back or you roll your tone back, yeah. but you don't have to roll your tone back. It's just thick. But if you roll I your love that back, sound. it sounds like a telly. And the other thing about that Seymour Duncan pickup ring too, I've thrown that in a couple of guitars or three pickups mm. because um, there, there's a pickup that he makes called um, the P rails, mm -hmm. which is a hot rail and a P90 slap together. And that's just phenomenal too. So you have two humbuckers neck and bridge and you put the P rail in the middle. Oh my God. You know, then you can combine the hot rail in the middle with the neck or the, 
bridge, depending on where you put it, and then you've got the P90 to choose from. So you put it in that Seymour Duncan pickup ring, and you get an actual humbucker that's a P90 and a hot rail single coil together. That's or, or hot rail, or one blade P rail, or a parallel version of it. You know, it's just all off of a pickup ring, which is incredible. After you did this, was your head like ready to explode? It, it did. And every time <laughs> somebody was like, up, like, what do you think of this? Check out all these sounds. Because in the studio, you're like, okay, you know, I, I wish I had a telly. Okay, well, I can get a telly now. Or I wish I had a <laughs> guitar. Well, I got to do that now. And then to the point where actually my friend Bill, who's, he's, my, he's my testing partner. Me and him go down the deep end. We're going down the deep end of Telefunk at 251s right now, testing microphones and stuff. <laughs> But Bill Molina, he's a great engineer, and um, he he's like, dude, do you think you could do that wiring on my guitar? I'm like, no problem. <laughs> I did it. He did a session. He goes, man, the guitar player, incredible guitar player. This guy named Zane Carney. And, um, I, I had him on my show. I know who that he's is. He's so good. I worked with his band with his brother, Reeve, and his sister, and um, they're such, such nice people. But he ended up playing the guitar, evidently, and loved the flexibility of it, too. So I, I actually... Dude, you got a plan B, C, and D here if this uh, engineering doesn't work out, right? Uh, I, I always say that. <laughs> somebody would pay me to do this shit, I'd be happier than picking shit, you know? Yeah. I, was, you know, I, can just, I like doing this kind of stuff. It's actually fun just, like, going down the wormhole. I mean, you do it on your own time. That way you make better decisions later on. Yeah, well, that's what is the the blessing and the curse of, of this, probably, you know, because it's, like, so intense and you can't do it any other way. At the same time, though, I, I, I'm really just like, okay, you've got to capture the moment. That's the one thing I realize and a lot of people just obsess about. Is it perfect? Is it perfect? I'm like, you know, it's perfect right now. The dude wants to play. Let's just capture it. And yeah. There's so many tools that you can fix anything at this point. You know, you capture a performance and it's out of tune or sounds like shit. And you just, you could fix all that stuff. You can't. Like the performance and the person is ready. That's what you need to capture. So being able to separate your 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 uh, obsessiveness about the tone or the the perfect microphone or the perfect pop filter or the perfect pair of shoes you're wearing while you're singing or the perfect cup of tea or whatever you know you just have to get rid of all that shit and just go in are you like that in your personal life are you good about like being in the moment I think so. I mean, uh, you know, there, I'm sure you can probably ask anybody and they'll be like, you know, I don't know, <laughs> but. Uh, I'm I'm pretty good at separating the two. I mean, I, I'm a I'm an all or none. I always say if I had a tattoo, I'd be fully tattooed. Or I'd right, be, right, yeah, I get you. If I'm gonna wear black. I'm wearing all black today or none. Yeah, yeah. but it's just it's just all or none for me. There's no, there's it's either left or right. There's I mean, when I'm mixing, it's a little different, but it's it's extremes. I always you know I mean, what's the point of being lukewarm water? To quote uh, Derek Smalls in Spinal Tap, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, tell me two or three, as if this, the 40 pickups thing wasn't enough. Tell me two or three of the most creative things that you've done to get cool to, to cool sounds. You know, like the, one of the funniest, earliest ones in, in life to me is, <clears throat> excuse me, like a lot of times you're moving a microphone and you have your headphones on, the engineer would send you out to the room and you're moving it. And, you know, when you're moving a mic in front of a guitar amp that's blasting, it sounds like a flanger. Right. So, you know note to self, human flanger. And then uh, I'm, I'm like, I was a very avid reader of, of everything. I can, there was a, an op amp labs bookstore across from the record plan. You can walk in and get all these uh, used technical books and you buy a modern recording techniques book and it would copyright 1972 or something. And you, you flip through there and you, you were just reading this. And all of a sudden I came into the studio. I think I want to say it was on a, uh, on, blues for the red sun that caius record and it was like the human leslie get on the lay on your back put a pop filter on a 57 and sit there and the, the mics you know the mic cable and whip it around in a circle in front of a four by 12 wow it, i'm like that's a human leslie right yeah pretty much that's better than, than any any leslie sound like those kind of creative things i've always been into that and, and it's fun you know that is amazing man see but like that is like I'm one of these guys, I think I'm good at like 
combining existing things. Like I could combine two or three things to come up with a solution for a problem, but like your next level kind of problem. No, but you come up with a a totally out of the box solution. And that, that is like such a gift, man. I I know it's work. It's, it's born out of work, but I mean, that's so cool that you could do that. Yeah. I there's a lot of things, you know, a lot of times you're recording back in the day, you'd have to commit, you know, now everybody records a snare with two mics, top and bottom, and they're on two separate tracks and they have control of the top and the bottom. And a lot of times you're just like, I only have one track. I still record that way. One track. There you go. There's a snare drum. You don't like it. Okay. We'll fix it. But you know, so they, to get more bottom snare, a lot of times we'd start reamping this before reamp was even a word. <laughs> you do is you set the snare itself up on a stand and you put a speaker on it and you pump the snare sound off of the tape through the speaker and it would vibrate on the snare and then you remic it and you bring that in while you're mixing. You couldn't even record it on the tape. You, you ran it live. Wow. Or I remember, you know, running bass amps live all the time. I was reamping bass. You know, back in the day when you're mixing people's records and the bass sounds like crap, and you're just like, okay, I need a better bass sound. Okay, I'm just set up a bass amp. And then you, there was no reamping. You just turn the level down from the tape machine. You pop it into a compressor and you put it on one to one ratio so it wasn't squeezing more. And then you turn the output gain down so it didn't blow up the amp. And no one cared that the impedance didn't match. They were just like, here it is. Dial it in, put a mic in front of it, EQ it, squeeze it, do whatever you got to do. And run it live for the next 12 hours while you're mixing. And oh, you want to remix it? Oh man, we're gonna need to get that bass amp back. <laughs> wow. You know, stuff like that. So, um, that's, yeah, that's that, so that's, cool. Those are my early creative wacky days. I mean, there's too many that to actually. I was one of the first guys using pedals that I can remember just learning from Jason Cassaro. I, he, he would buy, he bought it. I remember he bought two Aphex Oral Exciter pedals. And I'm like, why would you buy that? And he ran the whole mix through it. I'm like, yeah, I saw that on the videos. I was so like, wow. So it's like, if you think about it, why wouldn't you do that? But because it's not done, people just don't, it's like that door is shut down in your head, but you open that. Outboard gear, you know, I mean, I I love the way guitar pedal sounded. A lot of times you'd use an outboard gear, a piece of outboard gear and like, I love SPX 90s, but I don't think it's the greatest flanger in the world. So I'd use a flanger pedal instead when I'm mixing yeah. this stereo. I just use a guitar pedal. And, you know, before everybody was proper and reamping, and, you know, you, before you could even say the word reamp, before you got sued by somebody else, you know, we're just like, put it on an aux and Chad Blake was one of those guys who was using a Sans amp to blow stuff up while he was mixing, and he'd put it on an aux and on the console. You know, and I thought that was amazing. Just a very creative way to use guitar pedals while you're mixing. Now there's all kinds of things you can do with them. But I had a question here, but I don't. You're not in your studio. Do you have your Pikachu theremin? You know, I, last night I don't have it here. And last night I was like, I got to take that thing home, and I totally did. And I'm gonna have <laughs> no to send worries. It yeah, because like it, my kid, it's a Pikachu with it, a with a little antenna and stuff on it, and it's fucking crazy. It, it was adorable, actually, man. My 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 kids and they, my sons, they used to watch Pokemon, like you know, you know, like we'd watch cartoons or whatever. But it was so funny. I saw this. I gotta have that. Um, I don't want to ask you your favorite guitar pedals because there's tons of videos on YouTube. But if if you're comfortable, I don't, I'm not looking to out anybody, but tell me the two or three weirdest or most awful pedals that you've come across. God, well, I mean, you know, like, I could tell you the one. I wish I, I was at my studio now because I'd show it to you. Actually, <laughs> uh, I don't have it here. It's this Dan Armstrong. Looks like a wah pedal, but it's painted like a Cadillac with flames on the side. <laughs> Completely useless to me, but looks cool as shit, so completely useful that's that would be one i mean i mean there's i don't know one man's trash is another man's treasure that's another you know very true very true it could be anything i mean a lot of times the thing about guitar pedals to me is is sometimes they just sound good on what they weren't meant to be yeah like a sans amp to me is pretty cool on guitar but it's really good on drums and it's okay. really good to blow up a vocal so I mean, it's to me, they're like, they're just Swiss army knives, little tools. Tools. Yeah. 
you know, and I, you know, I've got three or four boss super overdrives, but how many do you really need? But you know, they all sound kind of different. It's just, this is weird. Do I, I, you know, I saw this morning that boss is making a, a tone bender. Okay. By Macari's, which got me incredibly excited. It's painted the same color and it's one of those Waza crafts or whatever they call the new boss stuff. You yeah. Know? And, um, I'm excited about it. I mean, why would I buy that over a regular tone bender? I don't know. It's probably going to be the same price, but it's kind of damn, it's pretty damn cool that it's in a short footprint too. A little boss. Yeah. I mean, you know, here's, here's my, my one thing about, about pedals. I saw Robin Trower play in Miami one day. And somebody, How good is that guy live? Oh my God. So ridiculously good. Oh. And the night before somebody had, they had robbed the van or the truck. Oh man! So he goes to Ace Music and buys a Strat off the wall. Ace Music, shit, I haven't heard that in a while. And he buys like a Boss Chorus pedal, <laughs> and whatever it is that he's got a wah pedal, and he plays, and it sounds fucking incredible. So that, and, and he mentioned it live too. He goes and apologize for my guitar sound tonight. I'm still kind of working it out. All my stuff got stolen, and I'm like, do you have to apologize at all? Because it. That shit came out of his fingers like nobody's business, man. It didn't matter. And he's using shit you can just buy out of a store. Yeah. He's so good. I've seen him several times, man. What a, what a great show. Um, was, you, you mentioned earlier, and I, you definitely um, walk uh, the walk about the comfort of a studio. And man, after I saw a couple of videos, I was like, and I, I wish I was sitting there on that couch with my feet up listening to you talk because it's like, it is a very comfortable, you know, it's uh, like a man cave. You have all these cool shit around. I mean, it's fucking uh, it's awesome. Like I, when I was 17. That was the intention. You know, yeah. The Sound city thing when people walked in and, and, you know, it wasn't very expensive and like in the, in the Dave Grohl movie, I was like, you could shit in the corner and nobody would say anything. It's just right. it's like that vibe, you know, not that you would do that, but. But it, no, you but it's in there and you it felt like you were in a rehearsal room. Like I always go into bands rehearsals and seeing how comfortable life was when their band played a song, and then then you go to the studio and record with them. And day one, and everybody's nervous. Yeah. And you're like, in that rehearsal room, it was so magical. And why is that? Well, there was no pressure. It was fifteen dollars an hour lockout, you know, for three. And there was, and it always sounded different. Like everybody bled into everybody, and they were set up live, and and you know, and so there was a monitor that was one thing that you know we, we did on pinkerton was the band didn't want to wear headphones so well, you know we use wedges why not who gives a shit so yeah. you know you just have to punch in everybody at the same time or just realize that it's just bleeding who cares that's, that's the beauty of music just you can play together let me just clarify that does not mean you go to joe's studios 15 bucks an hour <laughs> just want to pre preempt any any phone calls you'll be the room, the room, you know, sign me up for three weeks <laughs> well if you can play uh, no problem uh hey i'm going to mention some of the people you've worked with and if you could talk about joe how you got the gig and any any cool funny or interesting story about working with these guys man let's talk about Ten Thousand days uh tool but i also want to ask you a question um Rosetta Stone to me is like a fucking piece, like a, a piece of art. I mean, you know, like you, I hold that song and it's per perfect, everything about it. When you cut that track, uh, how did you feel about it? Um, the thing about that whole album to me was that I was very prepared when I walked into the studio because I've been going down to rehearsals and sitting in a room and, and believe me i'm not i'm good at math but not that kind of math yeah. and that was, that was a whole nother level of technique and I, I i tell the story where i was went down to the rehearsal room with the manager and i thought there was eight guys behind the door playing I was like, what yeah. the fuck's going on back there and i walk in and there's three dudes yeah. in the manager thing, and i'm like i was like danny carey is just like he's an octopus you know and it's triggering stuff so so anything and, and going on that record and listening to them play it over and over and taking detailed notes of sections trying to arrange the song and when they would call the seven part i would i you know and how many times is that and they would do these stabs and I'm, i would have to go hey man what's happening right there and when justin or adam would explain 
you know, what's going on. I'm playing seven and he's playing 11 and it comes back around here and then, or whatever, you know, things like that. So I'm, so going in and, and those songs to me were, I was, plus were, it was strictly on tape. Um, and it was a linear recording. So if they would play, we'd cut the track and then we'd cut the tape together. And this was the bed. And then let's do the guitars, make a, we call it slave reel. And um, so I'd, you know, stem out the drums on another piece of tape and then we do all the guitars and bass on that. But it, it was very much section to section. So the sounds were, they, they were built to punch in and work. And this particular, the new record was also on tape, but I assembled it in Pro Tools. Okay. And, um, I mean, it was all edited on tape, but, but he would play and then I'd pop the guitars in and then he'd play more. Pop them. And so it was a little more finessing in the box on this one. And, but the other one was, very well laid out in in a, in a linear fashion. So um, it was a learning experience for me. I mean, capturing his guitar sound and adding to it and how I thought it needed to be. And, and um, Justin and I switched his, uh, his bass amps. He had used a GK on a, on a session and loved it. So then we went through a bunch of GK stuff and ended up with some heads and Mesa cabinets and, capturing Danny I mean it, it was it was uh and and they cut live you know so so it really is the foresight of getting the big picture and knowing what works so but I don't know if there's anything really different in that song in particular for me than like Vicarious or The Pot I mean The Pot was the, pot the one that stood out the most because it wasn't done so there's always one that's not quite done in the studio on the on the last record it was Tempest but on the, on Ten Thousand Days, it was the pot, and it was kind of worked out in the studio. So it was a fair bit of a couple of days of experimenting. But you know that that was the one that I think got super creative. I, I tried to do print through, and the whole idea of it was the, he mentions muddy waters, and you know it's kind of bluesy, a bluesier riff. And uh, so I was trying to do print through, you know, and not, not what, what is pr what is print through? Print through is like on those. Uh, so so basically, what happens is when you store a, a roll of tape, normally you would store it tails out, which means it kind of wraps over itself. So when it's magnetized, the two pieces of tape that are laying next to each other will magnetize, but because it's covering that part up, you don't hear it. Okay. But if you store it the other way, you store it heads out, basically what happens is a piece of audio gets wrapped in front of a piece of audio okay. and it magnetizes a head. So like on old records, you hear the print through as you hear what's happening ahead of time and then it comes in. Okay. So I was doing that with the vocal. So if you listen to the pot again, you'll hear in the beginning of the pot, his vocal actually is coming in before he sings. And that's because I magnetized the tape by printing him hotter than normal and then storing it heads so that when he sang who, wow the who would leak into the front of the blank tape and it would magnetize that audio and it would be in time because it's, it's, it's this piece of tape rolling. So it's, it's crazy. So I was trying to pull off a lot of, a lot of weird analog stuff on that record too. Vocals all done the tape as well at very speed. I love war pigs. Who doesn't love the end of war yeah. pigs, right? I got kicked out of a bar for playing war pigs three times in a row on the jukebox. <laughs> <laughs> on the third listen they pulled the plug and threw me out i was like what the fuck dude you know but it's a that, weird reason to get kicked out of a bar but whatever yeah you know, i guess nobody can really dance to war pigs but <laughs> and uh, so a lot of weird vocal shit happening with various speeds and how he made it saying an octave high and turning it down and vice versa and you know making things so you always read about the john lennon's you know getting creative and wanting to sound like he's underwater and things like that. So why not just put the mic under the water? <laughs> How did, uh, I want to point out something that you said that you kind of skirted over it. Uh, you said, I went to rehearsals with them to listen. So I would be prepared, man. Um, that's serious. That's, that's, that's your differential, man. The, the extent that you're, nobody does stuff like that. Right. To me, it's, it's, you know, as, as an engineer, a lot of times you get paid by the day and you get called by a producer, hey, we're going to be at the studio on Monday 
for the next week, whatever. And that's your gig. But even then I'm like, okay, who's the band? Where are they rehearsing? Can we, are we going down to rehearsal? Can I meet him? Can I see what I'm dealing with that way? Because you want to get involved. You, you know, the worst thing when you're when a band's paying for a studio is to come in and realize the guitar player's four by twelve has two blown speakers in it. Yeah. You know, things like that. So I, I was I was really into I'm into being a roadie, no problem at all. Part of part of my formative career in Florida is is you know my friend Mike Little. He was he was the older dude around the block that played guitar that knew about Dimiola and Jeff Beck and all the all the great guitar players and and I'm growing up listening to like you know whoever I'm into at that time. And he's like, you really need to check out Uli Roth and you need to check out you know Larry Carlton on this Strikes Twice record. And, Uli he was. Mind blowing. Yeah. So 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 oh. awesome. Some of that all that spacey stuff he did just blew me away. And then and then the technical shit too. You're just like, what yeah. is going on here? I'm slowing that stuff down on a cassette deck going, okay, this is a major seventh arpeggio forward and a minor seventh arpeggio backwards. <laughs> doing a minor seventh forward and a major backwards. Just blowing my mind. But you know, that's the thing I'm talking about knowing the theory behind it. Right. You know, technically you don't really have to know it. You can just, I mean, some guys can pick that stuff up and just play it instantly, but I was always the guy who wanted to know what they were playing. Like, how do you, how do you come up with that? How did you hook up with Tool in the first place? I think it was through the Melvins, actually. That's the, that's the story. I did three Melvins records, and, and Adam and Buzz from the Melvins are, are friends, and, you know, they were looking for a different, different sound or a, a way to expand on the guitar sound, I think, and Stoner Witch was one of the funner. Anything with the Melvins was super fun, actually. Just, just no holes barred, you know. Just whatever you want to do. We'd walk in the door and, and walk in the studio, and the door would creak. We'd mic up the door, and that would be part of the. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, so many stories like that on that record. Is this is a lot of fun, man? You know? Just uh, taking a, a guitar amp and putting it in a tube made out of a carpet an open back like fender and then putting a kick drum on either end of this big tube and using PZM mics to mic up that and then pumping the vocal through the guitar amp and getting that weirdly out of phase stereo thing happening in a chorus to make the chorus vocal pop a little bit more, you know, just, just crazy shit like that. Just having fun and using contact pickups when you're playing a guitar and just taping it to the guitar uh, pick guard and using that to make that super pokey, thin, almost piezo-like guitar mm. sound blending into the metal to give it some definition or not, just affecting it with a flanger or something. And so I think it came out of that experimentation with the Melvins that years later turned into, I actually just watched some uh, unauthorized documentary on Tool the other night. And uh, um, they were talking about <clears throat> excuse me they're talking about uh, danny was a little worried because all the records that worked on were definitely not hi-fi right because at that point you know i could record clean but what fun is that you now I, I, <laughs> I went in on this fastball record and the beautiful session keyboard guys playing his little roads like all dainty and stuff and i'd listen to deep purple on the way that day and i was like fuck this blow it up let's get some john lord action on yeah. there guys playing and freaking out how he's like oh my god it's distorted and i'm like Shut the fuck up, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds killer. You're creating the sound, you know, and you play, you react to that. And um uh, and um so that that's that's more, sort of where it came from. And it took maybe two records with Dan to get into that super hi-fi fear inoculum, the drum sound is way more punchy and crystal clear. But but on ten thousand days, it's dirty and aggressive, man, and I love it. It's just literally one of the most perfectly engineered records ever like and i'm not just saying that because you're here to, i mean I, I, i've talked to my son about we've listened to this together a dozen times i mean it's a fucking amazing yeah, record really, man the bass sound on the pot is one of my favorite things too just, i'm gonna go back and listen to that because i know the vocal that you're talking about because i've heard that coming in but i want to just go re-listen to that whole thing yeah people ask about that and they try to recreate it digitally and i'm like it's just not the same man you know See, this is why you got to pay good money for engine. I mean, seriously, the amount, the dip, I mean, working with someone like you, and this is not like a commercial for Joe. He didn't ask me to like do this, but like as a business person looking at this, you get, it's like anything else in life. You get what you pay for. 
I mean, a record that someone's going to make with you is literally dramatically different than a record someone's going to make with someone else that doesn't, that's not showing up at rehearsal. That's, you know, uh, just using the, the conventional tools that a engineer in 2020 has. I mean, it's night and day. It's not going to be the, it's not even going to sound like the same band. No, I mean, I, if I go in, I go deep regardless. I'm just yeah. on this Fate's Warning record that I'm super proud of, man. It's, these guys have been together for a long time, man. They, they recorded it all themselves in different places and putting that puzzle together and, you know, things like that. There's, there's a bit of challenges sometimes, but it, and the songs are so good and the styles are so different. And I, I was listening to it all day yesterday. And uh, they've had a, a long storied career of cool records, but it, this one, I don't know if it's because I've worked on it or not. You know, sometimes you get to know the songs the more you listen to them, obviously. But from the second I heard a couple of these tracks, I was like, this is some great otherworldly stuff going on right now. Is, this re is that record out yet? No. Yeah, it just came oh, out um, maybe what, what, three, three weeks ago. Fate's Warning. Man, one of my favorite bands, Monster Magnet. You uh, did. Uh, last patrol and, and then the remix i think of that um maybe four records with those guys. yeah how did you hook up with those guys and do you have any cool stories or interesting story i mean i love that but you know to me they're like the uh one of the pioneers of modern psychedelic stone or rock you know i just love everything about their sound I mean, the, the more i got to know dave windorf the more i realized he is a freaking music historian like the the, the the amount of knowledge that came out of that guy, he would, he would go, I really, uh, you know, or mixing, I really liked this band for this song. And he would pull up some stuff like Thor. And I'm like, what is Thor? <laughs> Bodybuilder from Canada. And I'm like, really? You know, like, so then I'd go on there and find Thor, which just got re-released or something. And I'm going, holy shit, dude, this is fucking amazing. Like, like the, the music, the knowledge, and, and I knew Phil Cavano, who um, plays bass and guitar in Monster Magnet, but he, he was in a band with Dave early on in his life, and then he turned out to be the guitar tech on um, uh, which the album with uh, Space Lord on it, and, uh, and then he ended up joining the band again after that, joining Magnet for the for first time, but playing with Dave again, and so we, we've been friends a long time, but the the craziest part about the like Last Patrol to me and, and Milking the Stars is that he took those songs exactly as they were and then just decided he was going to maybe keep a vocal part or keep a drum part and reimagine the whole song in a different way. So maybe the melody was there or maybe the chorus was there or maybe the key was there but the song was completely redone. So if you listen to those two albums back to back, it's incredibly creative how, how um, deep they went to, to create this whole new album based on the previous album. Man, and you know what I need to do? I need to listen to one song. I need to listen to each song back to back because I listen to the albums, but like you got 12 songs or whatever. It, you, you know, you, it, yeah. I don't I need to listen to each song back to back. It will actually blow your mind how creative they are. And um, they did the same thing with another another album, Cobras of Fire, I think is a reimagining of an earlier record. And there's so much you know, history in that band too. It comes down to fuzz guitar sounds. And oh. How did you first connect with them? Like, how did you meet Dave, if you remember? Um, God, you know, I, I got a phone call. He had started um, scoring some music for a Warner Brothers film. And somehow, uh, somehow we got connected. I think I met him during the making of the the album with uh, Space Lord, which I can't. Like, I'll remember. tell you right now because I'm trying to think of it too, and and it's frustrating the hell out of me. God says no. I think this is the one. After. Yeah, that, that uh, might that might be it. It's, I think it's the one before. Monster Magnet, Space Lord. Let's see here. Uh, uh i love that song uh power trip power trip yeah Not so power yeah. Trip. and i went down to matt hides he was producing the record and um I knew, i'd met phil at that point and probably met dave at that point as well and then um 
God, so I got hired by Dave to do some music with him to record, and he was doing this score for a Warner Brothers show or a Warner Brothers movie. And then, then actually, we started working on a record after that with a different drummer. And the personnel had changed, and it was pretty phenomenal sounding. But um, honestly, it just turned into a bad situation. I ended up leaving. Oh wow! It just got kind of weird, and I just wasn't into it, and it was a uh, I was producing it, but it was uh, it was a little bit off the hook. I actually tried to mix a couple songs off of Power Trip too. I don't think they used the mixes, but um, and then I didn't talk to Dave for a long time after that. And then they made a couple records, and then um, out of the blue, I get a phone call saying that I'd be the perfect guy to mix this new record. And then I was like, no. Oh let's check it out, man, let's do it. And then he came out with Phil and, uh, and that was the start of like, I think three or four records in a row. Yeah. If you're, I don't, I'm not, I apologize. I'm not looking for gossip or anything. Is there, can you talk about why you left? And if it's, if you can't, that's totally cool. Yeah. I, you know, a lot of times when you're, you know, when you're, when you're making a record, a lot of times it, it's, um, I mean, it's an intense situation, you know, and, and there were, there were, things where I felt like maybe the song should be at this tempo and then we'd cut it at that tempo. And then, you know, Dave would feel like it was too slow. So we'd cut it faster. And, and a lot of times when you play it, it feels good fast, but then you just try to sing on it and it's too fast. And then, so there's a lot of going back and forth and indecision. And then it, it also, you know, sometimes you get used to working with guys that like to cut stuff up and fix stuff. Like even, even Weezer on, um, Maladroit was like that. They would play it and they can all play and they're great players. But then they're like, well, I feel like it's a little too slow. I'm like, okay, let's play it faster. I mean, I really want to play it faster. But can you make it faster? Okay, sure. I can very speed it. Oh, yeah, but we don't like the key of it now. Can you make the key? You know, and I'm like, keep just, the same key, but speed it up. Yeah. So I'm like, you know, you start getting into this program called Pitch in Time where you're you can buy a $15 automatic slow down or guitar program for that well back then it was a lot harder but you know i'm like going okay no but like my point is what are they doing you know well it's just because you can or because there's some indecision or or no direction or maybe maybe i wasn't the right producer or maybe i wasn't the rick Kasich who who could say my way or the highway or or whatever you know so i think at that point there was there was too much indecision going on and um and I just wasn't into it. And uh, they ended up going to a guy named Scott Humphrey who did a great job with them and just done a lot of big records. And so it just, for, for whatever reason, the thing is, the beauty of, of music like that is it really is kind of a marriage. You know, yeah. you have to, if you're going to communicate together, it really has to be 100%. And, and that's what I always say to bands when I meet them and, you know, back in the day, when audition guys and be a producer or to work on your own. I'm like, I just want the, the feedback as well. I want to try to make you make a great record. And, but if I go, Hey, can we try this? And you're not willing to try it. Then what's the, what's the point of me being here? Like, yeah, let's just try it. Because when we try it, it could be the worst. I always think <laughs> my favorite when I go, this could be the greatest idea I ever had or the worst idea you ever had. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, uh, or whatever, you know, some variation on that, but. No, but that yeah. makes sense, man, because it's, especially now that I know you a little bit, you're not taking, this isn't a gig. No, not at all. So it's a way of life for me. Yeah, man. And you're going in there and you're like, man, I need you to meet me halfway here. Well, you never know. I mean, if it's, you know, you, you, you're writing a story together in a way. Great analogy. You know, I mean, and, and granted you, you wrote the ideas of the book. I'm just facilitating the pages here and there, but maybe, there's room for another chapter that we never would have gotten to if you'd not tried. I'm not saying my ideas are great. I'm just saying maybe my idea is going to be amazing. You just want to do your job when it comes well, down it to it. It inspires you to do something else. Yeah, I, I first, totally get that. The first record I did with Chevelle, um, I think, you know, they're, they're a great band, and, but I think after that many records and a couple with the same guys all the time, you just you need something different. And I did some pre-pro with them in Chicago. And um, and when they came out here, we were kind of getting rolling. And, you know, I was like, there was this element of an, an acoustic track that could have been electric or more more ambient. 
and I had an H3000 and killing a little bit of time. You know, I'm like, hey, plug in. Plug into what? Plug into this and put it through this harmonizer and I'd spin the dial and it turned and land on the preset and I'd hit go and play. Play what? Play anything. You know, play that. Play that riff from that song. Play And those things, yeah, put you out of your comfort zone like that. Started making um, Pete, the guitar player, singer, main songwriter, compose in a different way, I think. And, you know, just open your ears to something different. You know, the bass player is, is a great musician. And um, I had a, an M, M, uh, M3 organ sitting there. I'm like, hey, can you play keyboards? Yeah. Let's plug that thing in. You know, there was no organ on a Chevelle record before then. But, right. you know, Mark's a phone laying around the studio, picked that up. And Sam, the, the drummer, um, could just be listening as things are happening. And all of a sudden, they see him, like, pick up a tiny little keyboard. And he goes, I got this idea. And I'm like, instantly plug it in here you go and he's tapping out a little melody on a casio keyboard that big and i'm like you know i've already experimented with that casio millions of times that are plugging it through echoplexes and marshals and making it sound like uh whatever a flute or something you know and, and he's just tapping out this beautiful little melody and i'm like that's the beauty of having your own place and, and being on your own dime and having that kind of inspirational stuff around but also getting people out of there their zone where they their minds are free and they can create and, and experiment and and like just try it maybe it'll never get used a lot of times some of those things never you just go down the rabbit hole you're like yeah it was cool but it doesn't really work yeah but what's the but, downside to well, try well, that thank you for trying it you know yeah, I mean, there's yeah. so much upside yeah yeah was, you know maybe it, maybe that melody that didn't work on the piano worked on the guitar instead or with the vocal so that's how you get to the in the end, it's all the, the end result that matters. It didn't matter yeah. how there. Wow. Uh, Wolf Mother, they're, they're out of Australia. Did they come to L.A. to work with you? To L.A., yeah, actually, it's, it's kind of really funny because I got offered uh, a meet to do the first Wolf Mother record. And at the time, I was like, oh, man. I'm like, and, it, and it was huge. Dave Sardi did the record. It was huge. But to me, it was like a kind of, it was kind of Sabbathy. But it was also kind of white stripes, and I, I didn't know how I felt about it. You know, I was like, "Is it going to be Sabbath? Is it going to be white stripes?" So I, I didn't. I was. Ah, like, let me I guess. Really, you prefer Sabbath? <laughs> I prefer Sabbath. <laughs> so I didn't go me there. Too. You know, and um, and then Alan Mulder got the gig to do the second record, and Alan Mulder is one of my heroes. You know, he's one of the greatest engineer mixers around. And he's producing it and he had called me up and he had asked me if I, he was going to go to Sound City because they wanted to work at some places that were, had some history. And um, he asked if I would record the drums and I was like, I would love to work with you. But if I record the drums, I'm recording all of it, not just the drums. And so they worked it out in the budget and um, I came along. And we Dude, right on, man. And I know you said that out of creative desire, not out of, you know, well, it's a bigger paycheck. Yeah. No, it's just because like, if you, if you mix a song on the record and then it sticks out, that always was weird to me. Like you're doing the single mix. Okay, now you got this album that sounds like whatever. And the one song that sounds like the sore thumb, you know? Yeah. Or, you, you know, you, when you, my many years of tracking full records and then having somebody else mix it and go, what just happened? Yeah. And like I delivered it. So I wanted to, I wanted to see it through and um, ended up going to Sunset Sound afterwards and ended up going to my place and then Al mixed it and he's, he's awesome. And it's, it's a very creative record, actually. Super creative record. And I like Wolf Mother, man. They're an excellent band. Yeah, they're great, man. I'm going to ask you one more. I'm being a little biased here. Fu Manchu. I love that band. Yeah. How'd you hook up with those guys? You did King of the Road, I think. Yeah, I know I worked on the record before. Action is go. So. Action is right. The action is go. I love that band. Another band I listen to my son all the time. It's funny. Jay, well, Jay Younger from White Zombie was getting into production, and he recorded uh, Action is Go and produced it. No, he he didn't record. He produced it, and um, I got hired to mix it. So that was okay. They were kind of in the same. We had talked before about maybe doing the record before that uh, because of the whole Caius camp and uh, Catherine Annie was the Caius manager at the time. I think she had something to do with Fu Manchu at that point. And it was all kind of incestuous, you know, dudes playing 
You know, well, that whole that, everybody. those desert guys are all uh, that, all that whole scene. scene is a little incestuous, yeah. Yeah, and uh, it's actually so it's so crazy because I ended up doing a record in Sweden, and Brad from Fu Manchu was like, "Hey, you got to meet these girls from Misdemeanor. They kick ass, you know." And then I'm in Sweden, and I hook up with Jenny from Misdemeanor, and we become friends. I hang out with her band. They show me around mm-hmm. Stockholm, and. Her husband is Gareth, who played guitar in Raging Speedhorn, who I also did. So it was oh, a man. Crazy little tight community. But um, so you ever, have I'm you thinking, worked with any Swedish bands? Oh yeah, man, Backyard Babies and uh, um, Apocalyptica from Finland. Um, there's so many I can't even think right. There's some now. great. Have you heard of the Quill? I have not. Oh, if you like stoner, the psychedelic blues rock, man, they're great band they probably have 10 records out. yeah i'm really I'm just there's a bunch of bands out there i don't check it. i've been to sweden several times I've been to finland and to norway I mean, it's been to Wales so many times uh, there's so many places um but it's usually you know it's they all like this like my studio to me in the end here yeah working, you know the beauty of going residential as a band is on their own turf usually saves money mm. when, you're, when you're in a place by yourselves it really focuses on work and not really getting wasted yeah yeah totally man uh, actions go came along man and that was one of those records where there wasn't a ton of money and um we had done the first queen's record out at a place called monkey in um, palm springs that belonged to a guy named steve feldman who had done the ep before the melvin's record um eating dust and it's awesome and um uh yeah, the EP before, what am I saying here? Sorry. For the Queens. For the, for the Queens. For the, so he had done Eating Dust, which was a Fu Manchu record. Oh, okay. And um, anyway, so Monkey uh, was on the picture anyway because we tracked Queens there. So I knew the studio and then we went out there and we, we did that record in 11 days, man. It was wow. insane. Like the guitar cabinets were back to back in the kitchen because it was kind of like <laughs> industrial complex and it was kind of like a, a little almost like a an apartment in a way so like when we, even like with the first queen's record the drums were cut into basically like the living room with with packing blankets stapled to the walls the dead knit and, you know so in fu manchu the guitar cabinets were back to back and cut live you know a little bit of leakage blasting in the kitchen and uh and and it was just for me 11 days but it's so fat and simple 24 tracks yeah. i don't think we used maybe 20 tracks on that album you know it's just thick you get the right sound and you experiment and you have fun and, and um, i always i always love the sound of fu manchu but that record with brant playing drums it's it's so crazy good from Brant from Caius. Yeah, he's he's a very talented guy, man. Brant York. Yeah. And I'm a guitar player too and singer. Yeah, I've got a bunch of his solo records. What a groove. He's got a good groove, man. And him and, him and Alfredo together. Alfredo was the third, uh, second drummer in Caius. So he was on the third real record for me, uh, Circus Leaves Town. So Alfredo played on that and he played on the first Queens. And Alfredo and Brant had a band together. So two drummers of Kai. Two drummers. That's and wild. Grant's playing guitar and singing and Alfredo's playing drums and you're just like, man, this is insane. So yeah, it's not a lot of guys that can play. I mean, like Dave Grohl can play both instruments. So, you know, well, you know, yeah, man, that, that new Foo Fighters track is killer. I, I have not it's listened so to it. so different. You know, it's like, I really liked color and the shape. Honestly, it's just so different when it came out. I like but color and the shape very much. How unique this song is. Um, you made a comment, something like people think that adding in more guitar tracks makes the guitar sound bigger, but actually it makes it sound smaller. I was hoping you could talk about that. Yeah. You know, I mean, I subscribe to this ACDC philosophy of Malcolm on one side and Angus on the other. <laughs> you know, and that that's really like the biggest, grooviest, fattest stuff you've ever heard in your life. You know, it, it sure is. I've known many guys that have recorded ACDC from Mike Frazier, who's a great engineer, to Mark Dernley, who worked on Highway, like four ACDC records, including Highway to Hell. And um, Mark laid it out for me one day, just like in theory. He, he basically said, you know, you're recording at 30 inches a second on a tape machine. So 30 inches a second of music. So let's say this is 30 inches. He goes, and the kick drum is right here. 
And he goes, the bass player is usually a little behind the beat, so he's over here. And the guitar player is always ahead of the beat, so they're here. <laughs> and now we've got this downbeat that's this fat. And then, you know, then you start tightening things. Now your downbeat's here, your bass moved here, your guitar's moved here, and all of a sudden now instead of this big fat thing that drops, you get this tick. So that's that was the thing that got me starting about less is more, mm. more, more definition. And then especially on guitars, like quadrupling guitars to me, like what is the point of doing two tracks to the left? If they're sloppy, it's gonna sound like a big chorus. So why not just put a chorus on one performance? And if yeah. it's too tight, then you're gonna get elements of where it's so tight that it gets thinner and then it's not so tight, so it's fatter. So it's, it seems to me that it's smaller. And, and it's the same thing with one mic over 10 mics. Like every day I get an email from a kid taking our class going, hey, how did you do this? And I'm like, why don't you start with one mic? Move yeah. the mic, you know, move that mic. You've seen that Dynamount thing, the remote box is amazing because you can put a microphone in front of something and move it in the most minuscule increments and start listening to what that actually does from the beauty of your own home in front of a pair of speakers. Do you, do you know a guy in Nashville? Do you know Jerry McPherson by any chance? No. He's a session guy. He developed, he's got a patent. He, I think he's, I don't know if that's the same thing you're talking about, but he developed this thing that moves things or that moves the mic around. Now, I don't know if that's him behind that or. No, I don't think it's him. It's a guy named Mike Russo. Okay. And, and, um, and they have this dynamo, which is like, same kind of thing, but yeah. these guys are super duper like, you know, uh, internet geniuses and code geniuses. And he actually has one he calls Jedi mode on the new one where you can move your iPhone and it changes the mic position. But oh, wow. Can you wire it to a Nintendo controller? So, Dude, pretty yeah. soon we are going to have no movement. I just saw this thing the other day. I sent this article to my wife. It's like uh, you don't have to get out and fill your gas tank anymore they've got these pumps you just put up your iphone and it does this shit i mean like what's the point what do we i mean how much more fucking sedentary can we get you know i mean it's what like i loved about being in new jersey when you'd stop at a gas station there was a person to put the gas in your car they employed a person to gas your car <laughs> I thought, this is awesome because <laughs> hires a person you know and you get your window clean you don't have to get out of the car but it's it's kind of cool it's not a robot doing it it's a human, no, it's a human. you get a personal touch hello mr wilson how you doing today fill it up with supreme please you know whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh knee-jerk reaction top three experiences you've had musically um one of the i'd say one of the greatest ones was chris cornell and Soundgarden singing specifically a point where you know i mean he would he would pick up a guitar and just start playing along to stuff and just play the most amazing stuff and seeing him live and watching him detune his guitar and just start a song and then detune a couple strings like tony franklin on bass you're just like mm -hmm. how do you even think like that you know i mean somebody changes my low e to drop d it takes me an hour to figure out oh i can play with one finger now <laughs> <laughs> guys are like detuning certain strings of the guitar and refretting the way they play and, and not making mistakes. It's mind blowing to me. Um, so what was it like when you heard his vocals for first time? Cause his uh, well, I mean, so in, in, in person, it was ridiculous. Not to mention the beautiful human being and the great storytelling and the fact that he gave my dog credit on the album. Yeah. I saw that. That was a bullet. Yeah. That was that my previous dog. He would come over and like, I'm like, Oh no. He, he's howling while Chris is singing, like right in front of him <laughs> on the couch, you know. And I'm like, oh shit. And then the album comes out, and Chris loved it because he loved dogs. He had great stories about labs and stuff. And, and he's, I see additional vocals bullet. I'm like, that is that was very cool. Supreme human being, you know. Um, Dave Menachetti from YT, you know, I loved YT early on I'm from the very first Yesterday and Today records and working with Mike Stone. He was producing YNT and a guy named Tom Size, who was also a great engineer who passed away a couple of years ago. Um, but uh, Mendicetti laying down on a couch singing through a 57. Incredible vocals. And it was, just, it was like none of that like 
pretension where you had to, oh my God, you have to sing in front of the 47 and you have to have the pop filter and you have to have the beautiful vocal booth. None of that. This dude's laying down, comfortable, singing with the 57, kicking ass. Just a real musician, you know? So those, those one of, that's a lesson too, just the comfort factor. Um, I don't know, there's, there's so many of them. You know, every, every record has its own thing, you know, to me. Um, Give me one more. Yeah. Is something that really made you feel like good or like, yeah, man, I'm glad I put my 100,000 hours into this. God, I'm sorry, I'll mention so many. Apocalyptica recording cellos that sound like electric guitars and, <clears throat> uh, you know, playing Bark at the Moon to the, to the, lead cellist <laughs> just going all right we're trying i'm trying to go for this you know and he's like you don't realize this is a cello do you and i'm like no man you got it you can play those kind of you know that bark at the moon with the phaser on it and he's doing some shit on the cello where he's doing pull-offs and i'm up i mean it's so easy on the guitar man check this out and he's like this is a cello you know and he's but he's ripping it up and he's using his chin to fret the fingerboard on the cello while he's doing pull-offs. It's so wow. Yeah, so he's like, I can't grab that note there, you know? And I'm like trying to grab the note for him and it doesn't work and he's like, I got it. And he's playing the cello and he's using his chin to play. And I mean, that was one of those moments where he's like, these dudes are super human, you know? How do you play? They're playing better than guitar players on cellos. That's and so cool, man. I couldn't even get a note to come out of a cello and these dudes are, are playing like Metallica covers, you know, like that's where it kind of started, I guess. That's nice, man. What were uh, some of the low points or dark periods you've had to deal with and how'd you get through them? Well, so, uh, all the world leads back to Doug Bossy, actually. So, <laughs> 2017 to me was one of those years where, you know, I mean, like I had a lot of things coming through, but it wasn't very good musically. So I didn't want to do it. And obviously, the, and the money wasn't really good. And, and I have a studio and the overhead's fucking crazy. But even then I'm just like, this is not very good, man. And I don't feel it's rewarding. So, so um, I had visited Doug and he's, um, he's such a nice dude. He, he bought a, sure a lap steel, a pedal steel, excuse me. And he showed me his playing pedal steel. And I was like, fuck, I'm going to get one, man. It's, I'm gonna, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to sit around and get better at writing music and learning plugins and learning synthesized software, you know, things like that. Just plugging in guitar pedals, just doing weird shit and experimenting. And so, so the long story is that basically I bought a pedal steel, tried to take some lessons. I sucked. But then I ended up putting some you know, putting an Evo on there and running it through 10 electroharmonics pedals and creating a bed of noise and downloading some new software that I wanted to check out and playing the rolly keyboard through it or whatever and just doing stupid shit. And Doug comes over one day and he's like, what's going on here? You know, and I'm like, I'm just kind of composing some of this music. And he's like, it's kind of pretty good, man. Do you want to give me a couple tracks? And so I ended up giving him like, you know, 10 songs. I was calling it Evil and Darkness. Five songs started with the letter E and five songs with the letter D, the Evil and Darkness. And then I submixed them down into 60 pieces of music and he put them in his library. And evidently my music is good for Yanma Fix My Life. So I'm good for people in trouble out there. But that's so I'm a little bit of ASCAP money here and there, but I, you know, I'm, I'm so you got a lot, bunch of placements. I'm working, I did not enough, but I'm working on a series of Evil and Darkness and, uh, you know, Electrified, Destructive, or ethereal and delicate you know yeah so that's that's part of my overall plan but that the long story is that year was very depressing i i remember talking to my managers you say always wondering if you're ever going to work again you're like is there ever going to be a band that comes through is there ever going to be money you know and i'm sure a lot of people are going through that right now you know and um it was it was depressing i'd come home at seven o'clock every night sit on the couch next to my dog and watch movies and just feel like I got nothing done, you know, and even though I was writing music and doing stuff, there really isn't any, any income or any, you know, the, the, in, the, the not knowing is the weirdest part. And, and Doug actually uh, recommended some book and for the life of me, I don't know, I don't have it next to me right now. I don't remember the title of it, but he's like, 
I read this one point in my life when I was kind of going through the same shit. And uh, it was a book written by a guy. It was totally like a self-help book in a way of looking outside your life and back in and going, you got to look at the, the glass being half full kind of thing, you know, as opposed to a lot of people look at the glass being half empty. Yeah. So it was a, it was a good read, man. He was a big part of, he was a big part of, first of all, the, the book and second second of all the inspiration to write music and third of all you know uh, taking some of the music into a library and you know putting it in uh, putting it in placement getting it in his library for you know some mailbox money here and there and, and actually uh, instilling some confidence in my ability to to write some fucked up shit i guess <laughs> well, you know what Thank, thanks for sharing that. I think every entrepreneur and, you know, a lot of guys don't realize, but if you are in the music business, you're an entrepreneur, you yeah. know, um, I think everybody has periods of time. I know I've certainly had periods of time like that and it sucks. Yes. It's the not knowing. I mean, you spend more time working while you're not working. Awesome. Yeah. And that's awful. Cause you know, and I'm, I moved my parents out here. You know, and I, I did a record that sold no copies in America, but 2 million copies in England. And I got a royalty check and it was a good size royalty check. And it was enough to, to buy a down payment on a, on a relatively cheap house then. But then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, now I have a mortgage. So now, and I have a mortgage, not for myself. Yeah. Now I got to keep these people in a home. So then you're in the life insurance and you're in the like, all right, so if I die, at least they don't get screwed and they can keep living in the, in the house or whatever. So that whole things of the responsibility just weighs on you, man, you know, and then, you know, going into business for myself was a huge ordeal. I'd, I'd been talking to two guys that were, you know, you know, when you say going to business yourself, opening your studio. Opening my studio, yeah. I mean, at some point, there was no money, you know, not a ton of money to make records. And I've been working in, obviously, in studios forever. And you get 20 grand to make a record, you have to pay a studio a thousand bucks a day. And it's going to take 18 days. They're getting 18K, you're getting two, and you're working two weeks, 12, 13, 14 hours a day. I mean, you might as well bag groceries at that point. Yeah, so, man. And you can't survive on that if you have a mortgage or another overhead or whatever. So, uh, you know, at some point, but actually in, in retrospect, it was the greatest thing ever because the night before I was going to sign a lease, these guys backed out, but it was too late for me to back out. So I basically signed a lease by myself. I became the sole partner and then it became extra heavy, you know, on, on, I think it takes a toll. It's like when you, when you buy a car, it's like, oh my God, what did I just do? Or you buy a guitar, you're like, oh my God, what did I just do? You know, <laughs> what did I do? But now I'm in debt 30 years. But that's how the world is, man. You just take those chances in yourself. And, and in retrospect, I would have had to give those guys half the bread and now I don't. So it was the best move of my life, but it's, it's funny how, I mean, I, I'm a spiritual guy. And it's, it's funny how sometimes you're dealt these doors, like that old, you know, what's behind door number two? What's behind door number three? I'll take door number three. And yeah, you know, and I've had a lot of paths. Sometimes they're not the right door, but uh, I think there's somebody definitely going, all right, you're, you're okay this week. Take the door number three. And uh, thanks for helping that guy out or whatever. You know, I don't, I don't want to, I'm not, I'm not going to say I'm going to pat myself on the shoulder and I'm the most uh, charitable dude in the world, but I, I try to do right by everybody. Yeah. What, what, uh, what happened in two, like what snapped it business wise? Like, because usually I find when that happens, it's, you almost go from like feast or famine to feast is, is the way that often works. Yeah. I mean, I, I think at the time for me, um, you know, bands are in between cycles sometimes. It, it, it never really, it wasn't really, I didn't need to work with big bands. It just, it just became, you know, how it is like, you know, everybody's a producer now everybody can oh, yeah. drums you know and so so you get these projects where i'm like hey check out my thing and i want you to mix it but i got five bucks and then i'm dealing with the most amateur tracks in the world and i'm just part of the reason we started teaching workshops too is the same thing i'm like you know just the art is gone you know and if it keeps going like this there'll be no art 
I mean, I've literally had people ask me how to how to get the piano into the Pro Tools rig, and I'm like, "What are you talking about?" Because they've only <laughs> seen software. They didn't, they didn't know how to put microphones on a piano, much less how to route the microphones into a mic prees. I mean, it's it's unfathomable, you know, when you when you think about it. So, 2017, it became a lot of these little records were just like, I was like, man, I don't give a shit if they had a million dollars. It's just terrible. I'm not going to do it. And no one's knocking on your door. It's depressing, man. You know, when no one knocks on your door. Oh, to- especially when you put in the kind of commitment and time that you do. Yeah. I mean, in, in retrospect, it allowed me to experiment in a different creative part, like a part that was, was me in my bedroom at 17 playing music. Right. It's going, all right, I'm going to, you know, this is what I do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna learn how to play pedal steel, or maybe I'm not. <laughs> maybe I'm right. Evo. <laughs> maybe I'll put an Evo on top of it and create some some soundscape. But I'm, 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 I was learning a skill at the same time, not getting paid for it. But discipline is tough. You know, it's just when you're, to me, like it's like doing rough mixes. Rough mixes to me don't count. They're just rough mixes, and then then you're mixing. Okay, it's a different hat you're putting on. And the rough mix to me is like, it's good enough to check out. It's never like, like I can't do a rough mix like I would do an actual mix. Hmm. Yeah, so, so the same thing when I'm, when I'm working by myself, I'm just like, well, it's not really, it's important, but it's, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get so focused that I go down the deep hole, deep hole over here. I'm just going to go in and have some fun and just, just learn and do things for, on my own time. But, but it, at the same time, you know, when, when there's no positive reinforcement at all or, or affirmation, you know, you're just like. Um, oh, it feels horrible. Believe me, I've been there, yeah. man. I know. Yeah, it's just, and I then 2018 that. comes along and it just doesn't stop. And then I'm just like, you know, now I can knock on wood and I go, man, you know, sometimes you, you always go, oh, sometimes you can't get out of jail. Sometimes you can't, you can't, you wish you were in jail. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's a feast of family for sure. Thanks, man. Is there any, uh, if you had to give advice to young Joe, assuming you'd listen, anything you would have told yourself that would have made your life easier? It could have been, you know, business, you know, work, a personal, anything like that. Well, you know, I think a lot of, like, young Joe in college was so, um, Phil from Monster Magnet. <laughs> Young Joe from college would have studied quite a bit just to realize that he probably didn't need to study as much and could have focused elsewhere. And I, I still use that example sometimes. Sorry. Is that a bass tone that you, your ringtone? It's, it's all because he's a. Yeah, oh, okay. It sounded like, I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> probably going, dude, I checked out that pedal you told me about. It kicks ass. <laughs> um, like part of me just goes, you know, you, sometimes you just overthink stuff. I, I actually sent this email to a kid that took our classes um, uh, a couple of days ago on Sunday. He just sent this email that was basically a dissertation of what not to do in life. And, and my <laughs> whole thing was like, I'm like, just don't, you're overthinking it. Young Joe would have overthought everything. Just I really need to know every aspect of calculus. Well, no, I never use calculus again the rest of my yeah. life. The fact that I discipline myself to get through it is the important part. Correct. You know? But you don't know that at the time. No, you don't. And and you and think it's the the the, the, the you got to do it. You got to do knowledge. That. You do class, but you know what? I probably would have passed just enough. It's not like I'm operating on people, you know. Yeah. I remember a guy telling me when I was knocking on the 50 doors, dropping resumes off, a guy going, you should have come sweep my floor for four years. You'd probably be better off than going to college for four years. And I thought he was an asshole. But in the end, he was probably right. Yeah, but no, that's not someone, that's not something. You, that's not something you tell somebody. No, about. especially you know, a young kid who's looking for a job, man. Yeah, yeah. And I would never tell that. But what I, what I tell these kids that come to me, I'm like, a lot of them, you know, the whole reason I actually started my classes is because these kids wanted to assist for me and help me. And I'm like, well, what do you know? In my day, I had to wait six months for Mix Magazine to print the recorded studio directory of Southern California. And then I'd have to jot down what studio name was, who the manager, what number, 
what kind of console they had. If you didn't know anything about consoles, you couldn't get on the internet and go, what is an API? Right. You know what I mean? And, and now it, this stuff takes one second off your phone. So if I, I, I went and had coffee with 18 kids and I was like grilling them and not one of them, only one kid. I was like, well, what's your, who's your favorite producer? I like this guy. Okay. Why do you like him? Because he did this, 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 and this record. Well, why do you like those records? Cause this one sounds like, it was cut on a knee. This one sounds like it was mixed on an API. This one, you know, and I'm like, okay, here's somebody who's actually paying attention. Now I'm going to get on the phone and get you a job. But, but, but the rest of them, I'm like, this, this is a, you know, there's, there's things that you need to know. Like, yeah. you know, you need to know like who Martin Birch is, if that's the kind of music you listen to. I mean, yeah. and, and the records that he did and how he did them and, I watched an interview with Terry Manning last week, and, and Terry did, Manning, he did like Van Halen, I think. Terry Manning did uh, ZZ Top, okay. But he also took over Compass Point. He was an artist in Memphis through that whole era of people. Let me see, it's my mom. No, sorry. I don't know if you can hear that or not. But, don't worry about but, it. But uh, you know, Terry Manning is—he's—he's is, he's one of those guys too. You learn from all these people, and then. These guys lived it, man. You know, they, they, I think I, I am more like my, when I go get my taxes done, my, my accountant's always like, well, what percentage of business did you use on your car? And, and, you know, I guess most people would just drive to and from work. I'm like, it's pretty much other than me visiting my mom, it's pretty much a hundred percent business. Well, how can that be? Well, cause I'm driving to the music store to pick up a guitar pickup to throw yeah. in the, you know what I mean? And I'm driving yeah. here and I'm going here and I'm dumping gear off here and I'm taking this to get fixed here. So, so, you know, I, I don't know if I would do anything different. My biggest regret is, you know, not, not getting married, not having kids. I love kids and stuff, you know, but it's, you make those choices. I, I remember just working on a girl forever. And then she finally agreed to go away with me to the Grand Canyon. And I got a call to work on Scott Weiland. And I'm like, Stone Temple Pilots, holy shit. All right, so I guess I'm not going to Grand Canyon, you know. Back oh. then. And that's, that's the guy I am, like, very career-based. Yeah. You know, and, and especially some part of that is out of necessity. Part of that was having a mortgage, you know, for my parents. And, uh, I mean, if, if I lost my house or whatever, I'd be like, whatever, it's my house, my fault. But when you, when you, when you start to pay on somebody's house for them, and they're, my parents were old, you know, at the time. So um, – there's a, there's a few regrets. There's a few guitar amps and a guitar that got away kind of thing, but <laughs> I don't really have any major regrets. other than, you know, what, what do you do when you get old? Who do you leave all this shit to, you know, at this point, man, you're going to have about 5,000 people <laughs> raising their hand. <laughs> they hear this. Uh, you mentioned gear. What's your go-to guitar right now? And, um, not even well, you could address this either way your personal favorite or your favorite in the studio like what's what do you like the best for recording and, and give me your top three uh, well the, the bill nash les paul is definitely one just because it looks like a 59 jimmy page and it's 2007 and i don't really care if it falls over because it's so dinged up already because he, he distressed it and it's it sounds killer I didn't even know he worked on Les Pauls. All I see him is Nash Tellies and Strats. Yeah, he does amazing Strats and Tellies and he does Jazz Masters and a couple uh, interesting. But you know when he sent it to me, he did this weird wiring on it where you, you rolled your tone back to get it to be a humbucker. Or where you rolled your tone to 10, it became a single coil, which was wow. a phenomenal. And he said it was some kind of 70s DeMarzio wiring. But in the studio, it didn't work out because, you know, the first thing you do when somebody's like, hey, tune up. They always hit all the knobs on the guitar and you're like, holy oh, shit, man. You know, I didn't jot down where the tone was. Where the <laughs> was. So, so I was like, I got rid of all that. And then I just did my own thing on it. But so that, that's definitely one. He, and he's, a, he's an awesome dude to talk to. He's an amazing uh, uh, historian of music as well. He, they're in uh, Seattle, I think. <clears throat> yeah. 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 Um, my, I'd say my, you know, my, my second favorite <laughs> Paul Rivera Jr. gave me for my 40th birthday and this Maneric guitar. And I guess he's worked for BC Rich at that point. And um, it's this elaborate guitar that looks like it's got flame shooting out of it. 
and it's huge. And um, you know, oh, that's the one that's hanging on your wall. Yes. And yeah. and you said it looks ridiculous, but it's on so many records. The sound. Yeah, and so I, you know, I'm like, all right, it's hard enough to get anybody to play anything in the studio. Sometimes you're like, oh, this is the the John Petrucci Mesa Boogie, and they're like, wow, well, I don't want, I want to play my own amp. I'm not going to play. <laughs> you know, I'm like, who gives a shit? It sounds killer. Shut the fuck up. You know. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. So, you know, getting anybody to play anything. So it was in my house for a while. And I remember sitting on the couch and pulling it out of the case. And it's huge because it's got all these flames. And if you really look at it, it's an insane piece of work. I mean, it's chambered, flamed. It's got the most amazing binding around every flame. It's got these pickups in it that sound killer. And um, the thing is, it's kind of short scale. So it feels good and it's easy to play. So I was like, this guitar is so easy to play. Anybody can play it. So I got it in the studio and I plug it in and it sounds ridiculously good. So how do I get people to play it? Well, there's a... <laughs> how do I get people to play it? <laughs> there's a band called Fair to Midland and uh, they were in the studio and um, they were great. They were a great band. And the, the bass player had this flame hat. And, and every time they pick up the guitar and play the guitar, they had to wear the hat. Oh, right, right. Became part of that thing. Wear the hat, the flame hat, play the flame guitar. And, you know, it's one of those guitars where no one will ever admit they played it, but everybody has played it and everybody's like, this guitar kicks ass. What you kind know? of pickups are in it? I mean, do you, do I you think it's know? 57 classics, honestly. I don't, I don't even those know. Are, those are great pickups. Whatever's in it is killer. And uh, I, I was a huge fan of Charlie Watkins from Watkins Electric Music. He, he was the godfather of the P, PA. Is that the Watkins Amp? Watkins Amps. Watkins, Watkins Dominator. Watkins Dominator. Yeah. Amps, Jokers. So Charlie Watkins was a friend of mine uh, up until he died. And I still talk to his widow like once a month. And um, his brother, Reg, made, had a whole line of guitars called the Rapier. And uh, my friend Dan, who's a he's a triumph repair guy and designer and stuff he he put a piece of tape over the eye so it was raper <laughs> <laughs> and the, the guitar is just phenomenal my friend chip ellis who works for van he worked for he was van halen's guitar tech at fender is his uh, custom guy at fender he uh, did a fret job on it. it cost more than a damn guitar itself you know what i mean like it's the most phenomenally playing guitar but it's a it's a 60s Watkins guitar and it's it is phenomenal and people come in they play the raper and they're like what it's got four pickups in it they look like it has four pickups yeah electric humbuck uh, a little single coil hum like they look like humbuckers like electric foils or whatever they call them yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, it's got this knob that switches between two three four or two and four but it, it was one of the first guitars that we've seen that had a kill switch on it like uh, I have a Tom Anderson that'll go from some super crazy split pickup configuration right to the humbucker. So you can go like really clean stratty and then go instantly to humbucker with one switch. And this Watkins was doing that in the sixties. It would go from like some weird pickup configuration right to the solo. So you can flip between rhythm and solo. It was awesome. That's cool. I've never heard of guitar with four pickups. That's wild. Uh, I've heard, I've had a lot of, uh, guys on the show talk about that Watkins Dominator. Is it that good of an amp? It is phenomenal, man. I mean, Billy Gibbons, I have, I have two Watkins Jokers, which are even more rare. The Joker has a tape echo built into it. So, so there was Watkins and then there was Wem. So I asked Charlie why he changed to Wem. And Wem was just Watkins electric music. And he mm -hmm. changed it to Wem to compete with Vox because that's how it was back in the day. Just, you know? Wow. So, and, and you know, there's things where he had a, the original Watkins copycat look like a, a makeup case. And that's where he got the idea to put the tape echo in. And then I asked Charlie, I'm like, how do you, how did you go from blue to black? He goes, I ran out of blue. You know, it's so simple, <laughs> but he was making PAs for David Bowie and Zeppelin and Hendrix and, and every, Big person, Thin Lizzy, they were using the copycat echoes. Brian Robertson was using a copycat echo in front of his guitar, his guitar amp. And so um, one of my favorite Charlie Watkins stories, and this is actually, it's, it's actually 
mind blowing to me, but I have an original Watkins copy cap, really old, and one of the heads broke on it, the tape head. And I remember calling Charlie and, and uh, asking him about it. And he goes, it's really hard to find this, but I'll look around. And um, he sent me a head in the mail. Wow. I put it on there and I didn't think twice about it other than thank you for finding one. Later on, fast forward, uh, he's passed away and I'm seeing a, an old Nam interview with him. And he, they did an interview with him in his 90s and he's holding the very first Watkins copycat in his lap. And he's talking about it and he's pointing to it and he goes, it used to have this many heads, but it's missing one head. This one here is gone now or something like that. And I thought, holy shit, he took the fucking head off a of copycat number one and sent it to me. So my yeah. copycat would continue working. And I called his wife immediately and she goes, yeah, I didn't want to say anything. He just, he knew that you would keep it working. So he sent you the head. I'm like, I'm like, are you serious? Like that head could be in the, in the you know, the Museum of Natural History in England. Yeah. It's that was an incredibly touching story, man. He's yeah, so that's true. man. And when someone does something that kind for you, it's it's crazy. It's, yeah, man. It's it's really. Uh, he was so nice too, man. Just uh, like I, I bought this Wem Joker. It's called the DB Joker, and and then, and he goes, oh, I only made twenty of those. I'm like, really? He goes, yeah, I made him for Bo Diddley. And I called it DB for Diddley Bo. And people <laughs> call it the Deep Blue and all this other crazy shit. But he told me, because I called it DB for Diddley Bo. And there's 20 of them. I have serial number 14. Wow. Yeah, you're just like, what is going on here? You know, I mean, Billy Gibbons came in and played on this Queens of the Stone Age record. And he came in with the Johnson J station. And I was like, you gotta leave that shit at the door, dude. That ain't ever gonna get plugged in here, you know. And <laughs> Billy Gibbons, he would have made it sound good, but he walks outside and plug him into a Dominator and a Joker. We end up Y and the two amps together. It blows his fucking mind, and he's like, he ends up buying like every Joker he can find, and the price goes from sixteen hundred dollars to ten grand. You wow! Know, he's giving him to Keith Richards and as a birthday present, shit like that, and and uh, but he was he was. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where just, just the, the tone coming out of those amps is incredible. And there's so many different versions of those amps that he made. And there's still, he made me a, a Dominator reissue serial number one. It's not exactly a point to point Dominator, but it's a great sounding amp. And he, he, he was, I was looking, I actually called him just because I'd saw a reissued copycat, a tube copycat. And I was like, I want to get one. I called him up and he said, no, I don't, I don't mess around with the tubes anymore. I'm too old but I have this digital one and I'm like, nah, digital, what are you crazy? Come on, old man. Yeah. No he goes, I'm going to send it to you. And if you don't like it, I can send it back. And I bought it. And I've since then bought three more. Wow. So it was four more. And then I've sold probably 50 of them for him because everybody that plugs into it, it's like, Holy crap, this is a great, you know, I use it on every single mix that I do every single mix. So he's with me every day. I tell his wife that. I go, Charlie's with me every day. He's on a That's new cool. show right now. <laughs> or whatever, you know. So let me ask this, Joe. They like if on reverb, if I see a Watkins, are those the those the real Watkins? They are, unless like if you see some weird stuff, it's usually somebody trying to capitalize on it. Like there is a company in England that started doing uh when you see the Pink Floyd at Pompeii and there that's a whole Watkins backline in there and people are using that cloth and putting the Wem logo on it those are totally unofficial oh you know, star starfinder cabinets or whatever they were called that David Gilmore uses or this is the pedal David Gilmore uses it's a Wem pet box or something and if you call I talked to his wife and I remember even asking Charlie he goes it's all fraudulent you know they're they're just people and there are people out there that do that shit yeah yeah copy stuff and then they put their likable look i like a friend of mine recently bought like a dyson vacuum cleaner and it was a clone you know like <laughs> isn't you know it's crazy so um, how, how yeah. does the dominator sound different than like for example i have this old pv delta blues amp which i love and i have a, a jcm 800 from i think the uh 80s maybe or 90s <laughs> It's like a 17 watt amp and it's kind of where Marshall based its being from. 
and and it's EL84, so it's got that AC30, AC15, AC10 thing. But he used an ELAC speaker, which is, ELAC is still in business, one of the German company. And the ELAC speaker in combination with the, the EL34s and his design, and it, it breaks up. It's just, I mean, I'm not saying every one of them's great. I'm just like any other amp, it's the same thing. I'm, I play through a few dogs too, they need to be tweaked and, or you know, re bias, re tubed, re speakered, whatever, um, re conned. But the, the dominator is like, it's just pure tone. It's just, it's a sound that you can get dirty. You can roll back and it reacts to your amp and get that volume back on your guitar. It gets cleaner. It's got a great tremolo. It's got the, both the instrument input and the mic level input, you know, where you can go to the second channel and you have volume and tone and that channel is just over the top because it's, it's made for like, you know, harmonicas or mics. So it's more level in it. So, so, so is it, it's two, is it, it's a clean and a dirty then? Is it uh, it's a single channel amp, but it has two inputs. So, so basically, I guess it's essentially a two channel amp, but not channel switching. Oh, okay. You know, so you have yeah. the volume and tone for the mic input and then you have volume treble bass tone or, or volume tone and whatever output level or something for the other side or it, and or actually i think it's actually most normal dominators are six knobs you have the tremolo two knobs volume and tone for the instrument input and volume and tone for the mic input and those are the ones they have like the weird shape they're not v front yeah yeah and yeah speakers shooting out way which is amazing because the dispersion is great part of his PA, you know, his whole idea is a PA. So I should keep that on my list and when I have an extra three grand one day and I see it on reverb, get it. When I was buying them, they were 500 bucks, man. It's so crazy. <sighs> Copycat echoes. I mean, if you want to make any amp come to life, put a tube copycat in front of it. Cause it's essentially a tube overdrive without the, you can turn the echo off if you want. You know, that's, I mean, that's how Blackmore used to get his 200 watt majors to move. He used to put them in front of, uh, you know, uh, reel to reels. Use the reel to reel as a preamp. And Iomi used to use a range master or whatever. I mean, you know, you need treble boosters to get the boost into that amp to make it speak a little more because the volume was so, it's a huge high wattage amp. But they used to preamp them with these tape echoes. And this thing, the gain on it is incredible. So it's another tube in front. So yeah, it's insane, actually. Um, tell me your top three Desert Island discs. No particular order and just for right now, because obviously this changes. <clears throat> okay, your yeah, yeah is out. It's definitely oh, out. man, what a great record, man. I am shocked that you said that. It's one of my first... Uh, LP. A sympathy for the devil on that, man. <laughs> Everything about it's so good from the album cover. You're just like, what is going on here? Yeah, with the donkey. Yeah. Yeah. Just, so that, right. that was one. My, my brother was really into the Beatles. And he was uh, more like Abbey Road. I was more Revolver. So, but I think at some point we kind of switched. So I, I would say you know those probably abbey road at this point for me mm -hmm. songs are so good you know recently i saw on instagram yesterday that it's kind of like the 20th anniversary of the first queen's record queens of the stone age yeah. that was a monumental disc for me as far as that career. probably got you a lot of business i would imagine it was a career shift i mean it's yeah. the time I'd, i had worked on this record uh, i had you know i tracked this album in three weeks it, it had a sound, did a rough mix, it was on the radio. And then uh, I didn't mix the album, it sold a lot of records. And basically I, I got nine grand and everybody else made money. And uh, the producer wanted me to do the next record, keep the dream team alive kind of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And the next record was some rock and espinol record and I had nothing against rock and espinol, but I'm like, uh, you know, and it's with some famous woman, and I'm like, I don't really care. I mean, here's some music that'll get me excited. <laughs> and he, he would, you know, thought I was questioning his judgment in music. And, and Josh had sent me a cassette tape and was like, you know, want to do a record. And um, I'd done three Caius records at that point. And um, 
he sent me a cassette and I put it on and I heard Mexicola and I was like, let's do it. So the, the six week, $30,000 gig engineering on some rock and Espanol record turned into a 17 days in the desert for probably $300 or whatever. But it was way hipper and way more rewarding. Wow. It set your whole career up totally different too. Different. I mean, that's why you do stuff because you love it, not for the money. And at that point, yes, you know, it was something different. I mixed it on a different set of speakers, so it would sound different. It was recorded differently, you know. And then uh, I had had a relationship with Geffen at the time, you know. I tried to take it in there, and they and then Interscope, I think, signed it at that point. But I wasn't cool enough to do the album, the next album. Once they got signed, you know, they had a great, <laughs> Chris Goss produced the next record, which was killer, and. and um, Adam Casper, the third one, and then I think then Josh and I got back together on um, Lullabies, the fourth Queens record. Great record. Um, yeah, and it's, you know, if shit happens for a reason, that's why you just, sometimes you can't overthink it, you just go with the flow, man, you just follow your heart, you know, and uh, Bruce Jacoby was the drum tech on that, and he was the drum tech on all the four tool, last four tool records, and, and uh, you know, kind of keep it all in the family. Missing the third CD. The third. Uh, let me see here. That's where always the pressure comes in, man, because you're like. Because there's so many of them. So Desert Island, where every song is great. I mean, right now, the new Fates Warning is in my, in my CD player on nonstop. But I'm, I'm going to go with that. New Fates Warning. Okay. And that's the one it's got every aspect there's an 11 and a half minute song in there that starts off with a little west montgomery octave jazz tone and then it goes into some demiola and then there's some fretless bass solo and then it goes into a little more demiola and another fretless bass solo and then in the middle it turns into this almost david gilmore solo and then a slide solo and then at the end it's got this crazy bass sound that's happening it's just it's, 11 and a half minutes of just nonstop. That's on my list. I'm going to check yeah. that out tonight. 11 solos of that thing. Hey, tell me uh, two or three things that you've done or two or three changes you've made that have had the biggest impact on your life, either personal growth wise, professionally, spiritually, anything that might be important to you. I mean, well, starting my own studio was, was a huge ordeal. I mean, at that point I'd been, you know, I'd, I'd been working and making some money, but it, the, the writing was on the wall that it wasn't going to be that anymore. So that, that was a huge um, ordeal for me too. And so, so cool how it worked out where your two other guys bailed and you were probably like shitting at the time, like, Oh my God, I got to do this all myself. <laughs> blah, blah. Literally one in the morning when they came over and said, it's not worth it to us. And I'm like, you ballless motherfuckers, you know? And, and, uh, you know, shit happens for a reason. Yeah. So that, that was huge. I mean, moving to California was a big one. I, you know, that's, if you're going to do it, you got to do it. But, but a lot of people come here and they don't make this, you know, you got to make a sacrifice, man. It's, um, are, are you one of these guys? I bet like when you were younger, cause people see that work ethic were you like the kind of people, someone would say, hey, man, you're going to be okay or you're going to do big things? No, I, I never, I don't know. You know, to me, I was always a rebel. You know, I, was, I would play guitar and I'd, I'd go to summer school in the summer just because I could finish college faster so I could get on with my life kind of thing. <laughs> you know, I was like, I felt I was behind when I got out of high school. I didn't want to go to college, so I worked. I was like, oh, what good is college? I mean, and because you don't really know what you want to do, I think. But part of it, at that point, from then on, I knew what I wanted to do. And that's a huge part of anybody's life, I think. You yeah, know, having a mission. You have that, like, there's a goal at some point. You might never achieve it. Me and my friend, John Paterno, who's friends with John DeFaria. Yeah, yeah. He's he, mentioned, he's actually mentioned him to me. So I've he, heard his name. He's a great dude. He, he always laugh. I go, set your goals low and you always achieve them. <laughs> <laughs> your priorities low you always achieve them so if yeah. i can go lodger right now 
I felt like my priorities are pretty low. I got laundry done. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I made a juice. Oh, I made a cup of coffee. You know, set the priorities low. But but um, knowing what you want to do is, I, w- I always have them. You know, you never know where it's going to go, and and you know who knows where it's going to go after this. But it's a good run, and it's it's nothing to laugh at, in my opinion. It's it's you know I don't have I don't need to put the gold plaques on the wall to pat myself on the back and go hey check this out. I know what I've done, you know, I've had fun doing it. I've been blessed to, to be able to find that path to do it and, and also put in the right opportunities too. I mean, it, it, all it takes is my dad used to talk about the one guy that, you know, gave, maybe gave him and my grandmother and his, his brother some money to buy a refrigerator so they can open their store and have refrigerated products. You know, that guy believed in him. He sold him a car really cheap because he believed in him. And I always like believe there's somebody looking out for you. You don't know, you don't know what it is, but if you if you think about it too much, you just destroy it too. He's got sometimes you have to let it happen. But you know, there is a greater being. I think that just goes, hey, maybe maybe don't go to work today. And there's a car accident on the 134 or something. I I don't know. It's hard, it's hard to say. No, I, I I feel the same way. I agree with you there, man. There's some yeah, totally. Um. You ever heard that story about, so they, your, your parents had an, everybody has an Eskimo. You ever heard that story? No. I, I, always, I don't know the whole story my son told me, but it's something like, you know, uh, these people were in the deep Arctic, Arctic, and they're walking around trying to find something and they're out for hours and it's freezing and they're cold and they run across an Eskimo. And, uh, you know, the bottom line, the moral of the story is the Eskimo says, oh, you, what you're looking for is right over here. It's just, you know, 10, 20, 30 yards away. And uh, everybody has an Eskimo, yeah. You know, and that that's, yeah, like, that's yeah. somebody, somebody looking out for you or guiding you. Or, I yeah. mean, you know, I, or it could I'm, could be but, spiritually as well. You know, I, I uh, I'm a glass half full guy. Yeah, 2017 was a tough year for me. It was just weird. It's hard to look at it as glass half full sometimes until you just go, oh, well, you know. I mean, I can survive. I could see a lot of people I talked to during COVID times was like, you know, I, I'm afraid to go out of the house. I've lost my job. I, I can't do what I do for a living at home. What am I going to do? And then it's man, and then falling into that funk, you know, and that's, that's a tough one, man. I got a friend going through it right now. And I was like, you know, in our business, it's a wave, man. You know, yeah. riding a peak one year and you're riding the trough the next year. Or so it's it's or whatever it could it could go hourly in our business you know one day i'm like hey check this out i just got an offer to do that and an hour later it got canceled i'm like oh <laughs> where it is so just just not letting it affect you mentally uh tell me uh most important thing your dad taught you i think work work ethic is definitely one of them i mean being being kind of humans you know he he when he was actually we lived in when we lived in tampa he uh got a job at the port authority and he became friends with you know these ships come in from all these countries and he's cruising around on a golf cart kind of security or whatever and he got to be friends with all these people to the point where i'd come home sometimes and there's a you know half a dozen guys from belize hanging around the table eating a home cooked <laughs> meal you know like there are any, he would drive them there and he would take them back. And, and, you know, to me, it was normal to like have every person of every color and ethnicity and race and religion in my house. It didn't, mm-hmm. it didn't matter whatsoever to, to them or to me, but sometimes, you, you know, your neighbors look at it like, what's going on over there, you know? And, and uh, that's a lesson I learned a long time ago. You know, he's, he's, he always used to say there's good and bad in every color. It doesn't matter what it is. And oh yeah, he's right. Taking that, you know, to heart. How about, how about your mom? Most important thing she taught you? Um, my mom is like, it's just. just I think she's like, um, she sees the good in everybody. You know, that's that's another thing. I don't know if I've ever. Um, I try that, but it's, sometimes you get jaded. You know, I, I I never realized it living in California. So I used to go back to Florida to see my parents and then I'd go to a mall or something and open the door for somebody and they'd say, thank you. And they're like, or, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, wait, wait a second. 
did you actually say that? Or I say thank you, and they say you're welcome. You're like, whoa, okay, because because a lot of times, you know, if you think about California, it's just, it's a it's this town in general. People come here to be a star, you know. And there's a lot of crazy. It's just it just is. Yeah. Like more so than any other town. I think the ethnicities of New York. Everybody's there to work and make a living. And yeah. If you kind of come here to be a movie star or a musician or a rock star, or whatever. Some fame, some sort of. Yeah. And, and that, that sometimes you kind of get lost and you turn into that. You're just like, I mean, I always say thank you to people. I try to hold the door for everybody. Sure. See, it, it clicked in me one day when I just go, man, this is, uh, you know, you can't take this town too seriously. You just have to, you just have to. And my mom is that person. She's, she sees the good in everybody. She, she'll give you a third chance. I mean, after four, she might cut your head off. But after three, <laughs> nobody's like, well, you know, you don't know how she woke up today or give her the benefit of the doubt or how, the, you know, and it's, it comes from being old and wise. Yeah. My wife's like that. She's always like, you never know what's going on in their life. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah or what side of the bed you rolled off of that day. You know, I mean, it's hard. It's hard to look at like stuff yeah, like that. Too. Sometimes it depends how, it depends how big an asshole someone is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Believe me. You know, but some, some days I'm just like, what are you gonna do? You just you to treat every day, you know, it's a new adventure. I was like watching cops because the cops are like, this is the greatest job in the world, man. I'm like, why is it the greatest job in the world? They're like, because every day is different. And I'm like, every day is actually different if you think about it. Yeah. Why not treat every day like a good adventure? Yeah. Hey, three more questions. Uh you have any hobbies outside of music? Uh, man, I, I don't honestly. I, I used to, you know, try to go boogie boarding and things like that. I have a dog. My dog keeps me on, on my toes. You're close with your dogs, man, because I know I, I I just you could see the the way you your fondness for them uh, in, yes, in your videos. So I think your my dog has like kept me alive, honestly. You know, they keep you they're beautiful conditional love and you have that you know, you have to take them for a walk, you have to treat them right. They teach you, you know, you know, this morning I got out, opened the door, my dog grabs this blue gorilla and goes running into the yard, wants to play fetch with this fuzzy toy. I'm like, immediately out of bed, all grumpy. I'm like, ah, you know, super happy, changes your mood, sets the mood. Totally. The and then she was like, yeah, she's stretching. I love it when you stretch. <laughs> Tell um, me. Yeah, okay. I don't know what the real hobbies other than. I don't know. Searching for gear, if that's a hobby. Searching for gear. gear. <laughs> no, gear that's music. Bed. That's music. I've been reading, actually. I love reading. I, I've been discovered this guy named Ken Follett. And um, man, Ken, I'm in F O L L E T T. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. He's like oh, the rock star of all writers. 160 million rec uh, records. I know 60 million books or something crazy. Yeah, I know I've read something from him. I have the tenth Ken Follett book right now. I just have been ordering up paperbacks on Amazon for like. The, what is he? Is it fiction or nonfiction? It's 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 weird. It's uh it's it's based around real. Like I just read a book on um, it's called the Third Twin, and it's based on test tube babies and how America tried to copy the Russians making the perfect clone. So it's based around real stuff. He talks okay. About politics but there's books in england based on real cities with fictitious people and fictitious towns but you know it it's 300 miles to scotland and they're crossing this river you know what i mean so it's 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 uh it's reality based but fictitious you gave me a lot of st i got a lot of homework from this man i have a lot of things i got to follow up with check out look at i mean god uh Two more questions. Most important lesson life or your business has taught you? God, you know, I try to say to myself, you need to enjoy life more, but I don't know if I, you know, part of me just goes, well, I enjoy life going to the studio for 12 hours yesterday and cloning drives and getting, <laughs> you know I mean? like, like I'm just going, there's no moron in the right mind would do yeah. this. But, but I looked up every two hours going, oh, it's only 4.30. Oh, it's only 6.30. Oh, holy crap, it's 12.30. <laughs> you know, so, so part of me goes, enjoy life more. But 
I, you know, I, when I, part of me would say, okay, maybe that, does that mean take a vacation and go to Portugal? Does that mean go to the studio and, you know, plug into a Big Muff or whatever? And I, I don't know. I really don't know. I don't really feel like, I, I think life has taught me just to enjoy it while you have it. You know, I mean, look at Eddie Van Halen, 65 years old. Yeah. But, I, but part of me goes, oh, man, I mean, better to be 65 and enjoyed it than 100 and hated it. So as, as weird as that sounds, you know, I think he enjoyed his life and he lived a lot of life. And sad, obviously sad to see him go, mm, but yeah. but to know that he did everything that he wanted to do, you know what I mean? Played with his kid in a band on stage and, right. and uh, made such great music. And I mean, part of me goes, I'd rather be the guy, you know, you see the, the, the thing saying, you know, better to slide into home face first than to hesitate on third base. Yeah you know so that part of it you know ed was ed was running yeah he sure was do, do you know do you know mike miller guitar player i don't he's in la uh he plays with boz skaggs now but he's a phenomenal guitarist he's uh kind of jazz sort of guy but anyway he said something um he was going on a trip to i think he's single now he was going on a trip to Hawaii and he was talking and I said, man, it's so cool that you do all this. And he said something, I wrote it down. He said, well, if it's on my wall, I'm reading it. He said, if you're going to wait for these things to fall in your lap, they're not going to happen. And I work a lot as you do. And I like what I do as you do all the things I do, the show, my marketing, you know, um, and it was weird. You get into that, we just booked like a little vacation to go away. It was like five nights. And I was like five nights. And my wife's the same. She, she's, she works hard. She's a realtor. And uh, we're like, wait a minute, let's turn our heads. This is ridiculous. Let's go. Yeah. Five nights, you know, or four, whatever it was, you know, I yeah. said, we just haven't been away in so long. And then by the end, you know, that was like at two o'clock in the afternoon by five 30, I was like, man, I can't wait till we go away. You know, a lot of it is just, yeah, so it's like leaving the cell phone alone too, and no idea I'm a slave to that. Yeah, it, you get into we're we're very adaptable, you know, as humans to good or bad. So when I when I go on on you know when I go on the road, when I go on to a residential place to work on a record, I'm gone for a month. I always think, oh, in a month, what am I going to do in a month? And then after a week, you're like, I don't need to go back. I can live out of the suitcase with the same seven pair of underwear. You know, <laughs> you wash them. Or whatever, you know, I don't, yeah. I don't, but, but Mike's saying, I have a saying, similar saying, I just say, no one's knocking on my door. I'm bringing the door to them. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's, that's a big part of it. No one's coming in. Who's in there? How do they know where you live? Yeah. You go out and go, hey, here's my door knock. Yeah. That's, that's what, what a lot of it's about that. And last question, man. And I, I can't thank you enough. You've been on here so long. We, we've both grown extra facial hair, man. I really appreciate all your time. <laughs> honestly, man. Over here. I think my neighbors get this lawn cut. So all I hear is, Bruh. no, I don't hear anything. I can't thank you enough for your time. This has been so cool and so interesting, man. Uh, what's been the biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years, Joe? And uh, how much of that has been intentional and how much is just a natural part of aging? Wow. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, obviously, as you get older, I think you start focusing on different things in life, as far as legacy, and, uh, you know, charity, and things like that. But personality-wise, I'd say probably the, the biggest change to me is I, um, I am very much yay or nay at this point. Like, I think I would have tolerated more as an earlier person, not necessarily for money, but just said, okay, it's challenging, but, but now I think like, like integrity is a huge thing to me. And if you don't have integrity, I don't want, you're dead to me. You know, you're that. dead to me. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's not New York. You're <laughs> dead to me. <laughs> that's, that's part of it. And, and you got to spit after you say that. <laughs> um, part, part of it's like, okay, I, I don't, I don't need to do it. Like, I don't need the abuse. Like, yeah. I'd rather work with nice people. Yeah. Like, I think I would accept more challenges earlier on, but now I'm just like, screw it. I'm not doing that. Right. You know, as much as I, I think, you know, even if I 
didn't have any money at all, I still at this point in my life go, fuck it, it's not worth the grief. Yeah. Well, you start, you get to a point, you realize like, is this a challenge or is it fucking stress? Yeah. Well, it turns into stress. Y- yeah. And it's like, yeah. no, I don't need that. It's not worth it. Yeah, totally. I'm, I'm in agreement. Less tolerance bullshit. There's some version of that is off is the number one answer for, for like people our age group. Uh, yeah, some, that's our, sums it all up right there. Yeah, the tolerance for bullshit. Yeah. Hey, uh, I can't thank you enough, but let's talk. You do these really cool workshops. You mentioned them a few times, prosoundworkshop.com. Uh, talk about those and uh, like maybe w- what's in there, how, how often you do them, where people, I know people can get information, again, prosoundworkshop.com, but go ahead, t- talk about it. It, uh, it started out as just uh, interviewing these kids that wanted to work for me and realizing they'd just gotten out of four years of recording school and not knowing the difference between a male and a female XLR cable. So... <laughs> So um, uh, the guy who used to assist for me, Chad Bamford, when I would mix at A&M, um, and I kind of started this thing. And, um, and we teach these classes, they're two-day classes, two days of drum recording, two days of guitar, bass, vocal, two days mixing, two days advanced mixing. We've done a splitting guitars workshop on Vimeo. We've done a, a, a band in its entirety, top to bottom, in two days. And it's we try to keep it to ten people, and uh, and it's it's usually in my studio now. It's partially in mine and a little bit in his, because he works in the box mostly. So it's nice to see that other part of it. Um, but it, it really it's uh, it's hands on. It's a uh, you know we find information on the web, but it's a uh, it's, it's uh, a community also. We try to make sure the art stays alive, recording and, and, and you know and it's perpetual as far as i'm concerned people send us demos of critique and listen to and and, and um, advice you know we, what do you think of this what can i buy blah 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 and it, it opens up the um, i think it opens just open up to hopefully good sound for people and and, um, and and just no bs you know there's no reason that you need to read an acoustics book or a calculus book at this point, if you want to do this for a living, other than knowledge, gain some knowledge on why things are why they are, but if you just simply want to know how to make your mixes sound a little more focused, then maybe take away the two computer monitors between the speakers so they're not way out here, you know what I mean? Like, like just reality, the things that we both learned, Chad and I both learned after 30 plus years of doing making records. At one point, he, he took over for me on Weezer. He took over on Malachory and did a couple of records with them. So by guys that have actually made records as opposed to being taught by people that have never done a record. And, you know, I'm amazed at some of these colleges that, you know, there are guys that are females or whatever that tell you this is how it's done. But I'm like, by who? Like, is that person ever even recorded <laughs> anything? You know what I mean? Like, it's, like I made by a record. Who? You can buy it. You can buy a record that I've worked on with my name on it. I can tell you how it's done, but, but, you know, and, and I get education. So education is a very important thing regardless. I mean, you totally the thing I learned about in college is I knew where to find stuff. I met people and made relationships and friends and I knew where to find facts and, and you make, you make of it what it is. I mean, you can, they can say, here's a calculus book, but at the same time I'm going, okay, what do I really need to know? You know? So, um, yeah, so that's that's the workshops. We, we were doing them twice a year, occasionally when we get breaks in our in our you know normal lives and making records. And, uh, at this point, I'm not really sure what we do with COVID. We might try to go into a an online thing, but and part of it is really it comes down to having hands-on experience in between speakers and you know listening. It's it's a little more intimate to me. Excuse me, and that. I don't know how much of that's actually going to translate online other than technique, but um, let's, we'll see. I haven't really, I, I need to think about it. You put up, uh, brought up some interesting thoughts earlier and um, it'd be nice to be able to reach the outskirts of the world without somebody having to leave their house and fly and then make that investment, which is extraordinary. And especially now in this particular point of life that we're going through, but yeah. Um, I think there's a, a way to make it um, zoomable. That that I mean, the knowledge to me is priceless. You know, if I didn't have the ability to sit behind Alan Mulder while he was doing making opinions and judgments, I, I wouldn't 
you know, I couldn't learn that on a YouTube video or I couldn't even really learn it in a book. I can only do that by experiencing those things myself and listening. So we will hopefully be able to we'll offer more classes at some point. But you know, to me, to me, it's all about reading, read it, educate yourself and anything you can do to help yourself. You know, I, I, I took classes at USC for two days learning how to use an SSL just because I want to learn how to use an SSL. So invest in yourself and take that $200 and do it any day. You yeah. know, $200 30 years ago. You know, so whatever you, whatever you can do to uh, invest in yourself as a, first of all, in your career, but second of all, as a human, as a human being, you know, I mean, better yourself. Totally. Like, you know, like I said earlier, the more you know, the better, and then forget it. Break the rules. Then forget it. I love that, man. <laughs> In fact, before we go, I just want to summarize all these, some of these quotes here, man. This is pretty, pretty prolific here. Uh, always, no, I can't read, always know as much as you can and then forget it all. I always believe in knowing as much as you can and then forgetting it all. Sorry, I can't read my writing as, I, as I'm going through this. All the time. That's what What's that? Have a good time all the time. Have a good time all the time. <laughs> uh, let's Six see here. Final tab. Uh, you just follow your heart and uh, there's a couple of others in here, but uh, if you're interested in the workshops, go to prosoundworkshop.com and on the contact tab, just put your, fill out your name and address or not name, whatever name and email they ask for. And then you'll at least get added to the list so that when these guys put out, uh, when Joe and Chad, it's Chad is name, what she said, right? Yeah. Yeah. When they put out their next seminar, you'll be on the work on the list. Uh, you could also find Joe on um, Facebook and Instagram. And uh, apparently they're going to be doing a, a, a social media workshop as well. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, Facebook, yeah. Facebook and Instagram. And uh, man, is there anything else? Anything? Oh, and uh, if you want to work with Joe, what does someone do? How, what if somebody wants to work with you, man? Like, how does that process work? Is there an intake form or? We have a manager and usually he gets the material and I, I have to listen to it. So um, the priorities are, do I like your music? First of all. Second of all, is it a career move? You know what I mean? It's, there's a lot of people out there with money and maybe they do write good music. But like I said, like my dentist wanted to pay me a bunch of money to mix his record. It's not really a, a career move to me because it's, it's like, it's not, it's not a forward motion. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a do it for money. And that's a not, that's not necessarily what I'm about. Um, but I do prefer to work with signed bands or at least bands that can get stuff out. You know what I mean? It doesn't necessarily have to be a major label, but if you're putting stuff out and you're touring on it, which could be, you know, different now, but in general, there has to be some self promotion. I'd, I'd much rather work with someone who's got something going on than someone who's not that's going to sit on it and just go, oh, thanks for working on my record, and no one's ever going to hear it because it doesn't really do me any good. It's like it's like uh, you know, just it's by the wayside at that point. I mean, it could be musically rewarding, but it's the, the whole idea is, is to to have everyone enjoy it. You know? Yeah. If you're not gonna do that, then what's the point? But, you know. And how do they get a hold? Of, so I think the word, the two words you said there that are like make the most sense to summarize is you got to have forward motion. Yeah, I think yeah. that's. How do they get a hold of your manager? And and uh, um, his name is Frank McDonough, and it's on my website. On okay, the management link, but it's uh, yeah, it, it is on management dot com. I think. I don't know. I just know how to call him. Yeah, we well, just go to go to Joe's website. It's JoeBarisi dot com, right? It's yeah. right. B A R R E S I Joe Barisi and uh, what's that? Two R's, one S. Right. B A R R E S I. I said that. This one. You did. You got it right, but no one else gets it right. He made some stickers for me. Actually, it's pretty funny with a little logo that way because that's like a pet peeve of mine. Nobody spells it right. I'm like, they can spell like the craziest name in the world, but they can't spell that. And um. It's no, I looked, I double checked two or three times before if it's like, I'm cause I thought it might've been two S's. I remember I'm like, God, I hope I got it right. I know I did. Anyway, uh, go to, uh, so go to joebarisi.com and then contact his manager, the contacts there. If you're interested in working with Joe, just give him all, you know, leave, give him a Dropbox link to your music, you know, use common sense, let him know what you think, why you think to be working together, you know, all that kind of stuff. And he'll a answer you back or Frank will get back with you and let you know. And, uh, 
anything else I could promote for you, man? No, that's it, I think. Dude, you're very generous with your time. I can't thank you enough. Thank you, brother. It was a great hang, actually. It didn't feel oh. like, you know, like we just having a good conversation, like hanging out, drinking a beer together. Like, I know. Oh. We, need, we need a drink and a cigar, and then we'll be set. <laughs> hang right. on one second. Let me wrap this up. Thank you for everything, man. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Uh, thanks very much, Joe Barisi, for spending time with us. Check him out online. It's Joe Barisi, B-A-R-R-E-S-I dot com. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, most important, man, remember that happiness really is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I am out. Thank you so much for everything, bro. Oh, it was awesome. Thank you.